<laughs> oh, I wish I would have been a little bit faster so the first thing everyone would hear would be, uh, damn you, wizards. <laughs> God, gosh dang it. <laughs> that would have been so good. <laughs> Just started without context. God damn it, wizards. God damn it, wizards. I mean... <laughs> Many uh, reasons to say that nowadays, but yes, yep. anyhow. Ah, uh, yes, <laughs> but ah, uh, hello everyone. <laughs> hello, hello. And uh, thank you for the resub, Liarq. <laughs> it really means a lot. Mm -hmm. Ah, welcome to Lore Lecture 2, Electric Boogaloo. Electric Boogaloo, it's time. <laughs> yes. Uh, of course, I am joined tonight with by, uh... Ah, oh, would you like to introduce yourself? Alright. I shall do so. Hello, everyone. My name is Osric Teller, your bard, storyteller, bartender, bard daddy, him bard, type again, many titles. Always all the titles. And I'm here to learn about, uh, lore. Because I always need more lore. Uh, everyone needs more lore. It's always a good time for the lore. The lore. The lore. <laughs> God damn it! Oh, like yeah. I'll, I have, I woke up and that's the only thing I've just been repeating, just nonstop. Just the lore. The lore. <laughs> need the lore. Yes, the lore. Oh, I mean, uh, you also posted earlier today that the the monthly uh, VTuber lore review is coming up. Indeed, indeed. So, it's always time for lore. I need more lore. Your VTuber lore handed over, Percy. <laughs> uh, I mean, me and Senna are still working on it. We'll get to you soon in the future, but uh, how about this is a bit of a trade-off, uh? After we're done here tonight, I'll give you a bit of a a bit of a fun detail about Percy's lore. Sure, that that ex is acceptable. I will take that much. Oh, perfect. I uh, but yes, of course. Uh, the topic of the evening is Game of Thrones, also better known. Uh, as the book series, A Song of Ice and Fire. I... Uh, and uh, again, thank you for joining me for as uh, tonight's victim, I mean student, Osric. Don't worry, I am a glutton for suffering, so it's all good. <laughs> thank you for having me. Mm, yes, that explains a lot. What, what do you mean explains a lot? <laughs> Excuse me. Do you, mind, do you mind explaining yourself there for a moment here? What do you mean by that? Are you calling me a masochist? Is this what this is? I mean... Maybe a little bit? Oh, man, I God, God damn it, I am... This is not how... No. I... I this, this, this is not... No. I'm uh, not a masochist, <laughs> goddammit. <laughs> Are you sure about that? Positive. I think. <laughs> yes. 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 Uh, it's just yes. Alright. Let me ask you uh, this way then. <laughs> Are you very sure? Yes, I am very sure. Positively very sure. Perfect. Yeah. Mm. Well, then. let's get started. This one. Indeed. Yep. Uh, good. Where do we begin, Percy? Where Where do we start with this whole song? Ah, yes. So. Let me just uh, do that. <clears throat> so it all starts. Back in the uh, late 70s and early 80s, when uh, two men named William Afton and Henry Emily opened a pizza restaurant. Oh, wait, shit, that's the wrong document, sorry. Oh, God, God. <laughs> I, I had a sharp tingling of fear on my back. It's just like, wait a moment, what the hell is... Oh. Oh, no. 
Wrong lord. No, take me back. Take me back right now. <laughs> oh, no, no. That, that, who knows? Maybe that's the, uh, the special one that's coming uh, whenever I hit 200 on Twitch and 500 on Twitter. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Imagine. Uh, I, I'm serious. I, I'm going to do a special lore lecture that's either going to be a topic like Five Nights at Freddy's where it's just going off theories or something like Lord of the Rings where I'm just going to go insane researching everything. One way or another is just insanity and madness. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, but this story seriously starts with this well, what is the Song of Ice and Fire or Game of Thrones? Uh, it is... This story starts with this man. George R.R. Hey. R. Martin. Just a guy. Yeah. Just a guy. I would say a little guy, but uh, he's not really that little. He's, no, he, he really isn't a little guy. I was I was trying to start with that, but I was like, mm, no, he doesn't quite fit the definition. Uh, he's pretty robust. Mm-hmm. Uh. Uh, and, I mean, his greatest inspiration for Tolkien was Gandalf's staff. God damn it. <laughs> God damn it. <clears throat> but he is a f American fancy author from New Jersey. And the first book in the series, A Game of Thrones, was published back in 1996. So it's older than both of us. <laughs> it is. Oh, yeah, it's straight, it's straight up is. God yep. damn. Uh, and here we have the five books of the main series out at the moment. A Game of Thrones, A Clash of Kings, A Sword of Storms, or A Storm of Swords. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hey, A Sword of Storms also is a cool title. Oh, yeah. Uh, a Feast of Crows, or A Feast for Crows, and A Dance with Dragons. A Dance with Dragons was the last book that came out in 2011, actually. Jesus. Bloody. Okay. Yeah, I did so, not realize it was that long ago. Oh. Yeah, so he's been working on the next book, uh, Winds of Winter, for over a decade at this point. Of course... I, 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 nope, sorry, go on. I, I, I get taking your time with your work, but god damn it. Yeah, I mean, he has been distracted by other things like... Uh, Writing for the show, at for some parts of it, uh, he wrote some things for Elden Ring. Not sure how much. Uh, everybody having G, R, or M as the starting letter of their names. Yep. I feel like that's his contribution to that whole story. <laughs> yep. Uh, it it is actually curious to think like, okay, how much did he actually write? Considering from what he said, it's like, okay, I wrote up like a primer for the lore and then sent it off and then I don't know how much they used. Huh. Uh, that but... is peculiar to say the least. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but uh, then he's also published like three lore books. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, and he's also done some other writing as well in that time. Plus, you know, he's an old he's an old guy, he's had some health issues as well that's slowed it down a bit as well. But mm, that's true. But the, the TV show <clears throat> also crashing and burning probably has not helped. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. Uh but <clears throat> I'm not gonna talk too much about the events of the show of oh. <laughs> Thank you, Senri, and ah, the uh, head pads needs to be moved a little bit. There we go. Uh, just a touch there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I will admit, my. Uh, do you mind if I just tell you just here my like the extent of my knowledge for all things Song of Fire, Ice and Fire, and Game of Thrones? Just so you have like an idea of sure. how little I know. Go ahead. So, uh, when Game of Thrones was first announced as a show, I decided, oh, you know what? I'll go and read the book. You know, mm -hmm. see what the whole deal is. So I started reading a Game of Thrones, got about fifty pages in, and then uh, returned the book to the library because I, 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 I did not get it. I, for some reason, I just did not like his writing style. It, 
uh, to this day, I still don't know what younger me was thinking, of just what rubbed me the wrong way. But I just did not, was not able to, like, keep on reading it. Then the show came along, it's like, eh, alright. I, I can kind of understand now. And I watched maybe four seasons of the show, and then I kind of stopped watching. Oh, fair enough. Yeah. that That is about the extent of my knowledge for Game of Thrones. Uh, I mean, it... <clears throat> that That's fair. I mean, you've watched, like, what many people consider to be, like, the best parts of the show. Mm. As a... Uh... As a sort of like reference point for how much my interaction with the series, I've read the five books. I read the the short stories of uh, Tale of Duncan Egg. I've delved into the lore, and I watched all eight seasons of the show. And uh. I mean, seasons one through four is generally seen as the best parts of the show. Mm -hmm. Season 5 is alright. Season 5 and Season 6 are alright. They're not as good as Season 4, as Season 4 is seen as the peak. Right. But they're not as bad as, like, Season 7 or Season 8. <laughs> Plus, Season 7 did have a legendary Swedish actor playing one of my personal favorite characters in this whole French or this whole setting. Oh. Yep, and I will actually get to that when I talk about that character a bit later. Okay, alright, alright. Also, that in school. Uh, it's also a legendary Swedish actor many people might recognize from Skyrim, actually. Wait, hold on. Hold, uh, hold on. As he voices Esbern. Oh! Okay, yeah, yeah. I don't, I'm, the names, the actor's name is still not popping up in my brain, but interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, huh. Let's get into the lore, shall we? Yes, the lore. Let us begin. Yes, let us begin with some geography. Ah, as always, geography is very important when it comes down to lore. Yes, and in this world of Game of Thrones, uh, the world generally doesn't have a name. Like, you know, a lot of fantasy, fantasy settings may give their na their world a specific name. But, hmm. like, you know, uh, Lord of the Rings has Middle-earth. But, uh, yeah, this is just... It the, is the world. Yes, the world. Uh, there are three known continents in this world. Uh, all three of them varying in uh, relevance to the main story, or main stories as a lot of different interconnecting stories. Right, right. And uh, let's start here with the most relevant one to uh, the story. Westeros. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes. <clears throat> uh, Westeros is uh, a decently sized continent, mainly modeled after, uh, I think, it's, well, main setting. Uh, it's mainly inspired by medieval England, mm -hmm. and, uh, well, medieval UK in general, as <clears throat> a lot of the regions you can, like, correlate to different regions of the UK like the Iron Islands feels like a very distinct uh, inspir inspiration from like Ireland the north is very heavily like Scotland and northern England hmm. the, yeah, I didn't know that actually yep. huh. uh, and uh, then you have uh, other distinct things like you have Dorne, which is more, you know, 
uh, like South Southern Europe, like bit more Spanish or Italian inspired, but also a bit of Northern Africa inspiration mixed in. Interesting. Which gives it a which gives Dorne a very interesting uh, sort of like uh, how what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it clashes a bit with the others, the other like regions. It it does considering yeah. everything else has been very like as you're saying medieval England is medieval yeah. like Ireland Scotland England and stuff and then you've got uh, Spain. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it makes for a very interesting sort of like uh, comparison between the two regions or the uh, like Dorne and the two like closest regions which are uh, the reach and the stormlands mm -hmm. uh, actually the, there are mi nine main regions of Westeros uh, technically ten if you count beyond the wall and the lands of always winter but <clears throat> there... Uh, there, there's a lot there but oh. and, it, and it's interesting it's nine regions even though it's the seven kingdoms as it gets called later in the sh okay yeah i was gonna ask about that because I, I i kind of vaguely remember the seven kingdoms but it's like okay what yep. happened to the other two <laughs> yeah and it's actually interesting why it's uh the seven kingdoms and i will actually explain a bit of that when we get to when i get to explaining uh aegon's conquest but, all right, all right. Uh, let's start up from uh, the north. Mm, ah, yes. A uh, cold region in the well, the northern parts of uh, Westeros. It's also the largest region. Yeah, it's just the the big old chunk up there that nobody really wants to go up to. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the Northmen are seen as very like ah, uh, uh, they're very much like uh, no nonsense, very quiet, a bit brooding. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, the other, especially when you get to like the Reach and the Westerlands, they have a bit of a tendency to look down on the North. Uh, but of course, there's also the very important detail that the the North features a giant ice wall that was created with magic. Oh yeah, they never really did explain who <laughs> made the wall, from what I recall. It's just it's there, it's big, it's keeping everybody safe. Question mark. Ah, uh, there there is an answer to it, but it's also there. Ah. Uh, but even that person, that character who we know made it, there's a lot of like differing accounts in regards to that character. So again, we come to the case of we don't really fully know everything here. Hmm. Uh, huh. Of course, uh, the the North is ruled and has been ruled by House Stark for about 8,000 years. Oh, yes. Uh, from the seat of Winterfell. Uh, the founder of House Stark actually just was actually the one who built the wall. He also oh. built, he also built uh, Winterfell, the, uh, the keep of the Starks. There's also some people that say he built Storm's End, the sort of home of the ruling family of the Stormlands. And also a very important place in uh, uh, the reach called the High Tower. Hmm. And uh, that man was uh, Brandon Stark. Brand the Builder. 
Oh, I, oh, oh! So this is who Bran was the 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 character we see in the show slash books. Bran named after. Uh, to okay. some extent, yes. Uh, there's also, kind of. yeah, he's also named after his uncle Brandon. Oh, so just a lot of there's just a lot of Brandons thanks to oh, yeah. Brandon. Oh yeah, I mean, a lot of the noble families have a tendency to reuse names. Mm, uh, true, especially the fucking Targaryens. But I'll, I'll get to that yeah. later. That's a whole other business. Yes. Uh, south of Westeros, we have the Riverlands. Well, an area full of rivers and a very uh, watery area mm-hmm. with a bunch of houses of varying uh, niceness. I mean, we have. Dude, my favorite is oak. Yes, my favorite is oak, Senri. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> they are ruled over by House Tully. Of, uh, I always forget, I forgot the, the name of, uh, their, uh, their area, region. Yeah, or, uh, their, uh, uh, it's River Run. That's it. Ah. And, uh, they are. Decently relevant family to the main story of the books, as uh, what uh, one of the main characters is Catelyn Tully, or Catelyn Stark, as she's mar- she married Lord Eddard Stark. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I mean, there's also plenty of other. There's wow. a lot of inter- <laughs> There's a lot of interesting things that happens in the Riverlands. Uh, we got a. Uh, old, abandoned, burnt-down keep that people think is cursed. Because, oh, because Because everyone who's ever owned it has died brutally. <laughs> oh, it's one of those haunted places. Yes. Ah, oh, yes. Senri wants an Ara Ara. So. <clears throat> ara Ara. Thank you. <laughs> uh... And uh, God, I'm trying to think as well, like other fun details about the Riverlands. Oh, uh, it's hmm. um, um. we also have uh, the Iron Islands off the coast here, which is again sort of based off of Ireland, maybe with a bit, maybe a bit of like Viking inspiration, like Norse, as they are. Very heavily raiders. Okay. And they might also worship a Lovecraftian elder god, but another thing I'll get onto later. Oh, oh, okay. That came out of nowhere. All yep. right. Uh, you gotta we're... love surprise Lovecraft. Yeah, exactly. It just reminds me of, like, there's just like a one random bit in like Lord of the Rings where there's like semi eldritch bits of just like. Oh, what was it? Oh, yeah, it was like when Gandalf returns, like after he had gone down to the depths after fighting the Balrog, and he's like, yep. I saw things down there that have no name, and I will, for your sake, not tell you of them. Yep. And it's just like, okay, Tolkien, just drop that on us. Cool, interesting, <laughs> neat. Oh, my God. Anyways, sorry. Yeah, it's cool. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, the Iron Islands and Riverlands actually used to be one region, technically. As it was the, the kingdom of rivers and isles. Mm. And then the Iron Islands decided to go, yeah, no. <laughs> we'll be off here now. Bye-bye. Well, well it was more that the uh, Aegon Targaryen killed their king and it's like, oh, hey, Tullys, you want these lands? Here we go. Oh, Greyjoys, uh, you want to rule the Iron Islands? Cool, just uh, don't fuck around too much. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, to the east, we find the Vale of Arryn. A mountainous region that is renowned for their knights. The knights of the Vale are said to be 
the great greatest knights in the realm, only rivaled by knights from the Reach. But they are great, ruled over by House Aaron of uh, the Airy, founded about six thousand years ago by uh, Artis Aaron, the first king of the Vale, the Falcon Knight. Falcon Knight. Yeah. Oh. As uh, what is this fire emblem? <laughs> God, now I'm just thinking a crossover between the Fire Emblem and Game of Thrones. Oh God, <laughs> oh God, I, you know, a Game of Thrones game with like the gameplay of Fire Emblem. I buy, I play that. That would be really cool. Hmm. Hmm. I think we're onto something here. Yes. Ah. <laughs> uh... But in the West, we find the Westerlands. Very, uh. Yes. There's hills and plains, a lot of flatland. Hmm. Ruled over by House Lannister of Castle Rock. Oh, yes. The and richest the family. And, uh, also kind of seen as the most self serving and ruthless of them all. Hmm. I wonder why. I wonder why. I mean... I'll get to that later. <laughs> <laughs> In due time. Yes. Uh, looks all looks at Land the Clever. Uh, but then we have the Crown Lands, which wasn't originally its own region... But it became a region roughly uh, 300 years ago when Aegon the Conqueror came and just laid down the law with his dragons. It's just dragons. Just a bunch of dragons. Yes. And uh, the main parts of the Crown Lands is, uh, of course, King's Landing, the capital. <laughs> there's also Duskendale. There's... Uh, the old uh, Targaryen home of Dragonstone. Uh, there's Very on the nose. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, there's uh, God, it's Driftmount, the old ta the old home of uh, the other Valerian family, uh, House Valerion. Driftmark, that's it. And yeah, also the capital is called King's Landing because when Aegon decided, okay, I'm gonna conquer Westeros, that's where he landed. Hence, oh, okay, gotcha. gotcha. Hence why the capital was built there. Hence the hence the name and the capital being there. Yep. yep. Uh, then we have the Reach. Gorgeous land where a lot of the farming is done. It's got flat lands, it got rich and fancy people. It, it's definitely the sort of like. The reach is definitely where. You, if you want to, like, the sort of typical snobby nobles, you'll find them in the reach. That's just kind of snobby central. Yes. Uh, they are currently in the story ruled by House Tyrell. But up until Aegon's Conquest, they were ruled by House Gardner. But <clears throat> when their king dies, or king died, Aegon rocked up and was like, Okay, uh, you... Lord Tyrell, uh, you can rule these lands. <laughs> oh, I see. Yep. Ah, uh, and, uh... There's also the fact... Th this is just an interesting lore detail. 
the founder of uh, House Gardner was uh, Garth Greenhand. It's believed that his daughters went on to found like almost all major noble houses in the Reach. They just got around a lot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> huh. They just kind of got around a lot, and then there you go. Yeah, it's a. Uh... He had a good old, good old nobility being very much just yes, uh, interbred within each other. I mean, it's again we want to talk interbreeding. To... Just you wait. <laughs> I, 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 I realize that just as I said, it's like, oh wait, right? There's, there's a bigger example in this whole setting here. <laughs> yes, uh, we'll get to the family. I'm surprised they didn't have the Habsburg jaw. Oh my god. <laughs> god, the Habsburg jaw is... Yes. What I learned about that is just like, man, man, no wonder kings were all kind of messed up back in the day. <laughs> exactly. What you need to, uh, you know, spice it up a little bit. The family tree can't become the family circle. No, it really can't. Uh, it also reminds me of like how King Tut, like they figured out how he actually looked, and just because of how much inbreeding was done with the pharaohs as well, he's he was not a good-looking man. <laughs> oh God. Ah, uh, royalty. Royalty. Yep. Uh, but next we have the Stormlands. A land that's almost constantly plagued by uh, bad weather. Uh, very on the nose, nose there, too. Yes. Uh, they used to be ruled by House Durandon of Storm's End. The Storm Kings. But No, no, go on, go yep. on. Uh, but after Aegon's conquest, they've been ruled by House Baratheon. As uh, oh, okay. the founder, Oris Baratheon, defeated... Actually, I need to double-check fucking the king's name, because it's like Agrilac. Yeah. Uh, Too many names. Yeah, Argilac Durandon. He defeated Argilac Durandon, the Storm King, in combat, then uh, claimed his home, took his family's symbol, and then married his daughter. Well, that's one way of going dumb, like just showing dominance <laughs> on your enemy. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> he shake your land, and your daughter too, at that. Yeah, he just... Establish dominance. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, sort of like on a lot of great warriors in the Stormlands. Uh, like there's also House Dondarrion, who has been very, very well known in the wars against Dorne. Hmm. And then finally okay. we have Dorne. Ah, uh, Dorne. <clears throat> Again, it's... Dorne is split up into three sort of regions in itself. There's the mountain, mountainous regions in the west, the desert in the middle, and then in the east, there's mainly the cities built around the coast. Okay, okay. And... Uh, a very important thing here I also want to note, note when it comes, especially with the, the Dornish, but also throughout Westeros, there are three main sort of ethnicities for uh, the people of Westeros, uh, which are the first men, uh, who were the first, well, men to settle Westeros back even before the Long Night, and the... Uh, hmm. Nowadays, their descendants can mainly be found in the north. But they're also spread out a bit throughout. Uh, there's the Andals, which came about 
2,000 years after uh, the first men and the long night and everything of, of that note. And, of course, they were led by Artis Aaron. And they are the most widespread of the uh, ethnic ethnicity <laughs> the ethnicities the uh, i also butcher how to pronounce that word all the time yeah as as the sit no as the ethnicity yes oh, yes i want i think that sounds right yeah <laughs> We well, know English. Yes. Hey, I mean, I I can get a free free pass here. English is not my first language, so. I should es- ethnicity. Yes. Uh, uh. Also, a very important note I should notice, <clears throat> as well when it comes to like notable features. Uh, first men descendants usually have uh, darker hair. Uh, gray eyes pale skin uh, while the Andals usually have more blondes or reds or brunettes Uh, eye colors ranging from green to blue tan to pale skin and then there are the Roinar which are almost exclusively in Dorn uh, they they have more you know, what what people would consider more of a like. Latin, mm-hmm. Mediterranean. Yeah, Mediterranean appearance. Uh, olive skin, dark eyes, dark hair. And though all of these ethnicity, ethnicity, <laughs> ethnic. You can do it. This do one it. word. <laughs> Ethnicities. Yes, thank you, Senri. Ethnicities. You got it. You got it. Ethnicities <laughs> are represented in Dorn as there are. Well, if you're a Dornish, you can be a stony Dornishman, a sandy Dornishman, or a salty Dornishman. Hmm. Uh, if okay. you're a uh, stony Dornishman, you you're probably from. Uh, the eastern sort of more mountainous region where mo where uh, it's more andal heritage more paler skins blonde hair blue eyes uh the uh, sandy dornishmen are the ones that live in the desert they have the more strong connection to uh, the roinar uh, with the <clears throat> olive skin and uh, and the dark eyes and dark hair, though, and then we have the salty Dornishmen, which are the ones that live across the uh, the coastline in the east or not east west. Oh, should I mix them up? It's <laughs> the mountainous no. area in the west and the coastline in the east. Oh, okay, okay. And gotcha, they, gotcha. They are the most varied. And, uh, with a good mix of both Andal, First Men, and Roinar. Hmm. It's interesting. I didn't know about like the whole like First Men, Andal, all that sort of business when it came down to the peoples of Westeros. Huh. Yeah. Uh, kind of just assumed they're all kind of there, except for the Targaryens who just kind of popped over from... Ah, yes. Whatever the other continent is named. Ah, yes. Uh, Following that you mention that, as now we get to... Uh... The perfect segue. I did not intend it for it, but let's say I planned this. Yes. Uh, let's start... I'm, I'm doing both the other two... Uh, re- uh, the other two continents together, because... The third one, there's really isn't much to say about. It's sort of there. Yeah. It's sort of there. But here we have Essos, which is mm. quite a bit larger than Westeros. It is, yeah. And it's definitely m- much more varied, much more diverse. As uh, It has a bunch of different weird 
it's a mix of things when it comes to inspiration because uh, we have things like the Dothraki that are very heavily based on uh, like uh, the Mongols. You have GT in the east that's based off of China. Huh. And uh, I didn't know that there was a China equivalent in yeah. this setting. Yeah, hmm. it really doesn't get much mention in the main story, especially not in the show. But uh, it, it's there, and uh, it. Uh, okay, I'm not. <laughs> uh, I gotta hold myself back from talking about the mm -hmm. Great Empire of the Dawn. <laughs> oh gods. <laughs> Let, let's just, just by the name alone. Huh. Yeah, there used to be an empire there about eight thousand years ago called the Great Empire of the Dawn. Uh, each of like the rulers was named like the Emerald Emperor, the Pearl Emperor, uh, and hmm. all the emperors were kind of seen as gods. Ah, uh, until something terrible happened. <laughs> Then there was no empire. Uh, I mean, a lot of things happened. The uh, the Bloodstone Emperor might have caused the Long Night, as he was a dark sorcerer and necromancer. Oh, that came out of nowhere. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that just suddenly burst onto the scene here. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Oh. Uh, <laughs> man, that empire collapsed long ago. Uh, but yeah, there's a wide array of inspirations here from like mainland Europe to uh, the Middle East and even well again Asian, ancient China mm -hmm. as uh, there's a lot of uh, different regions here we have like we have the Rhoyne here where the Rhoynar came from here we have uh okay. What remains of the Valerian Peninsula? <laughs> okay, interesting. What remains? Like, I know Valeria is like, like Valerian steel and all that, so it's like, what the heck happened? Well, uh, it's a little something called Doom of Valeria happened. <clears throat> Who would have sunk? <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Who would have uh, sunk? Uh, of course, then over here we have... Uh, the Shadowlands and the Grey Wastes. Oh, that's not forbidding at all. Yeah, the uh... The Sea, the Shrinking Sea. Yes, there's a and lot... the Poison Sea. There's a lot of seas in here that really should not be seas. Huh. Yep. Uh, but... Yeah, uh... People don't really go into the Shadowlands... As, uh, really not a good idea to go into a place called the Shadowlands, yes? Yeah, uh, it's just a really dark place. I mean, uh, there is a uh, sort of like city-state bordering it that is unfortunately not on this map. Called Ashai. People are scared of Ashai. Because the people of Ashai are... These strange people that all wear dark robes constantly and white masks. Oh, that's not odd at all. Yeah. Just every one of them. Just every single one yes. of them. Yes. And no one has ever seen a child there? Like, any trader that goes there has said, like, yeah, I never saw, like, kids or anything. Everyone walking around was, like, adults. And we, we just have no explanation about why. It's just yep. a mystery thus far. Yep, I mean, it probably has something to do with the... Uh, uh, the Shadowlands. Yeah, and, probably. like, one of the other big reasons people are fucking terrified of a shy mm -hmm. is, uh... Yeah, that's the, like... If you want to go to the place where magic is, like, most commonly practiced, it's a shy. Oh, you know that's something I've always been kind of like not being able to get like a grasp of in like 
this this setting here is like what the actual state of like magic is because it's like it's kind of mentioned like especially when like the show focused on bits and essos with uh oh god what was her name Mel- uh, daenerys Mel- yeah with daenerys and then there was the other the, the other oh god i the names are not coming to my brain uh the oh what was her name it started with an m the one melisandra like, gave melisandra yeah the one that like used a ritual to give birth to like a weird assassin <clears throat> yeah the baby demon thing yeah uh she's from a shy by the way melisandra's from a shy <laughs> oh that explains a lot <laughs> yep and i mean i i have a little bit on magic and because how magic works isn't really touched on a lot. <clears throat> it's okay. very... It, it's generally a rather low magic setting, as <laughs> very few people know how to use magic, and even though that's that do, it's like, okay, okay, they don't really use magic that much. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's kind of what I got the sense of was kind of curious if there was like any any more information about it because you know you, i do i do like my magic systems oh so same uh also just something i want to throw in here because i could not find a good source for it but i know it's the case somewhere in essos around the area of yt mm-hmm. there is like a cat people Wait, what? Like, think Tabaxi from D anD. d You're you're telling me that GRM and all of his wisdom and <laughs> lore writing with society. Yeah, I'm just gonna throw some cat girls and cat boys into this one section of the world. Yeah, it's just, just gonna toss them in here. Yeah, this motherfucker went. Let's throw some fucking furries in here. <laughs> Every good setting needs some furries. Yeah. I mean, again, I I know it's the case, but I could not find a good source for it to like specify where they're from. But they're just they're there. Yes, they're, they're in there. Like again, specifically from like the area around Yt. Of course, he. I don't know if he was really aiming for it to be specifically near like the China equivalent, but oh my god. <laughs> ha. Yes. Ha! Huh. Of all things, I thought I'd learn today. I did. I did not expect that uh, we'd have to backsy slash cat people. <laughs> oh, God! That George R. meant George R. R. Martin decided. Hey, yeah, you know what? My big intricate setting needs cat folk. Yes, it's like the felonids in forty k. It's just like like some lore writer just offhandedly mentioning. Oh yeah, there's an app human strain. That's just cat people yeah i mean it's not gonna say no more about it (laughs) exactly just oh here have this uh but then we get to uh the the one re oh did not mean to do it but the one region we know the least about so thorius The Dark Lands. <laughs> yes. Also just... The Dark a- Continent. <laughs> kind of, yes. Though also I want to point out for uh, the three continents we have, we have uh, Westeros in the west, Essos in the east, and in the south, Sothorios. Oh my god. Oh. Oh god. <laughs> oh man, I... Uh, I don't know how to deal with that realization. <laughs> I... <laughs> God. I'm shocked he didn't just call... I... Oh, wait, he did just call the North the North. God damn it. Yes. He did just call the North the North. <sighs> oh, man. Uh... I mean, hey, I guess it works, but... Gosh. <laughs> yep. Westeros, Essos, Sothor... Yep, yeah, not not a lot is known about Sothorios. Uh, 
some people have been there over the years, but, uh... It, it's very much described as sort of like, uh... Like a mix between, like, South America and, like, Africa. No, not Africa. Uh, Australia, that's what I meant. Mm. Especially, you know, uh... Well, imagine how, uh... People would e explain both of those regions when they were being, like, first colonized. Like and nobody has really brought back any info since. They're just like, yeah, we went down here. You don't want to know what's down here, but we went down here. Yeah, like, uh... Oh, yeah, we went down there. Uh, We lost, like, ten men to his tribe of cannibals. Uh, This one guy had his leg bitten off by a giant fucking vampire bat. Uh, or, uh, yeah, we had, like, ten people get their heads crushed by gorillas. Oh my god. <laughs> we're, we're not going back. It's just like, yeah, no, this is a dangerous place. It's it's not worth colonizing here thus far. We've got, we've got yeah, or land up here. Or, you know, a ship would go and never come back because they all died of some horrifying disease they caught down there. Oh, that too. Yeah, like, uh... uh I actually pulled up Wikivice and Fire just... And have, have that open on my other monitor just so I can list off some of the names for some of the fatal diseases can that can be found in uh, Sothorios. Of all the lore that we have for Sothorios, I, I cannot believe the lore is, Hey, you wanna know what kind of plague you can get down there? Yeah, like, uh, there's blood boils, uh, green fever, dancing plague, sweet rot, bronze pate, Ooh. the red death, uh, grayscale, though you can catch that, like, in a lot of different places. Yeah. Brown leg, worm bone. Oh, oh god, oh, <laughs> I, I hate that one, I hate that one, oh. Understandable. Oh. <laughs> Uh, Sailor's Bane, Puss Eye, Yellow Gum. Oh, okay. Papa Nurgle's happy down there, Jesus. Yeah. Oh, boy. So, uh... I there. can't get over the warm bone, oh. Yeah, the, yeah that, that, that's fair. I saw that one, I was like, oh, oh, that, that, mm, I, I'm curious, but also terrified. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the other ones like, okay, he's a typical, like, plaguey disease type, name's Warmbone. Oh. Oh, I can picture that vividly, and I hate it. Yep. Uh. Yeah, so that's, uh, <laughs> Sothorios. It's not a nice place. Yeah, no. There, again, there's a reason why, uh, they say, like, yeah, we don't go there. We don't go to the Dark Continent. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, next thing is religions, because, of course, very important to talk about <laughs> God, to have God and anime on your side. Exactly. It's a vital, it's a vital piece of in lore indeed. Tell me about the God, or gods, or... Yeah, I mean, uh... What I have here is uh, the sort of five most important religions thro found throughout the... Yes, it is, Henry. Ah. <laughs> uh, I mean, smart, smart thinking there. I will agree with that. Exactly. Uh, but uh, I've... Uh, the f I mean... The power of God and anime literally at your side, yes. Exactly. <laughs> hmm. Yes, uh, I have the five sort of most spread... The five biggest religions, let's say. Okay. Uh, both uh, from Westeros and uh, Essos. Mm -hmm. Though, uh... 
most of them are mainly centralized in Westeros. Uh, but let's start with the faith of the old gods. Uh, which is the sort of original faith practiced by uh, the first men that settled Westeros. And uh, they actually got this from an other race of people. Oh. But uh, I'll, oh, get, oh, okay. I'll get to that later. Oh, all right. I did not realize there were others, but okay. Oh, Let's yes. Continue. There are <laughs> others. Uh, there are no, like, real specific gods here. There's uh, very much the belief that there are thousands of thousands of nameless gods that are always around. They're in everything. Hmm. And they are mainly prayed to through these uh, weirwood trees. Uh, with the red leaves, pale wooded faces carved into them. Okay. All right. So I, I was, I was, because I, I kind of remembered as vaguely as well. So the face bits are just like carved, and they're not actually. Yeah, they're carved. naturally growing. No, okay. they're, they're they're carved into them to. Uh, it, it's like it is. It's a religious practice. Mm, okay. Uh, and uh, the faith of the old gods is still mainly practiced in the north. And. The North, is, yeah, the North is like the only place still fully practicing this faith in the Westeros. Okay. Uh, most of the others got converted into uh, the faith of the Seven, uh, which is uh, it's seven gods. <laughs> uh, okay, so it's a it's a pantheon. Yeah. Okay. This uh. Uh, it's a, yeah, it's more of a pantheon. It's uh, kind of based off of... There's definitely some sort of uh, inspiration from, like, Christianity here. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, Considering it's a pantheon, so... Yeah. Uh, but uh, it it's the weird thing. It's kind of a pantheon in the same way as, you know, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Oh, okay, so it's... Ah, uh, yeah, look, so they're all seven different persons of a one deity, if yeah, I'm getting this correct. They're all sort of, like, s different aspects of a greater whole. Okay, ah, uh, so it's more like... less a tr It's kind of like a trinity, but in this case, be like a sept... Sept... Septinity? Sept... Huh. Yeah. Sept... Septunity? Yeah, kind of. And yeah, yeah that is also a good uh, sort of comparison center. Uh, as, uh, but the sort of like gods are the father, the mother, the warrior, mm -hmm. the smith, the maiden, the crone, and the stranger. Hmm. Okay, so they're all representing different aspects of... Yeah. Of this one god, or of just the different domains of life in general, I guess. Yeah, uh, like the father is all about judgment and law. Mm -hmm. It said he's the one that judges. The mother is loving and protective and all about life and care. Uh, the warrior, obviously. All about warrior, or war, pr fighting strength, and protecting people. And, uh... <clears throat> There's the crone, that's all about wisdom. And then... Uh, the smith, you know, obviously about creation, about mm. mending, about... Putting things right. Yeah. 
uh, the maiden is about youth and to protect the women specifically. And finally, the stranger is death. Ah, okay. That's that's interesting. It's like I kind of like this like seven aspected god. Yep. Business here. It's interesting. Yeah, uh, again, it's the mo- it, this is the most spread out religion throughout uh, Westeros. It is also hmm. through the Faith of the Seven that the Westerosi sort of knightly chivalric traditions come from. Oh, that makes sense, with, with the warrior being one of the aspects. Yeah, so there is a high focus on chivalry there and uh, there's also why that only people who follow the seven are knights hmm. and from the north there's only well in the main at least main book series there's only one knight from the north all other like northmen don't they are not called sir. They do not refer to peop- themselves as knights. There are no knights in the north. Makes sense, because they all... I was going to ask about, like, what is the exact relation between, like, the old faith and the faith of the seven, then? They just kind of warily respect each other or tolerate? It, it, it's kind of like... Uh... Oh, hi, fish. How are you doing? And yes, breaking in. Uh, it, it's very much the sort of thing of yeah, we, we'll kind of allow you guys to do whatever you want up there in the north. Uh, especially as uh, the real uh, again. Uh, the pra- the faith of the old gods was practiced by the first men, and uh, the faith of the seven came in with the Andals. And as the Andals oh. established all their own sort of kingdoms, they just like, okay, uh, you uh, first men, stay over there. We don't want to deal with you too much. Keep to your heresy over there. You do your thing. Exactly. You do our thing. Exactly, especially as uh, in West in SOS, there's at least one more. Well, there's uh, at least one more religion practiced by certain inhabitants. Okay. Uh, then of course we come to uh, well, another very interesting. religion both in how it relates t- to the name of the series and uh, like actions in the world oh okay uh, all right uh thank you for dropping in fish and uh thank you for the lurk uh i have i hope you have a wonderful day but that is R'hllor, the Lord of Light. Oh, the 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 now I'm I'm again like bits and pieces of like the show are coming back to me. It's just like, ah, uh, the thing that the guy yeah, ready forgot her name, Melis Melisandra. Mel- Mel- Melisandra, yeah, yeah, the the one that Melisandra was going all on about. Uh, yep. Um, okay. Melisandra is what's referred to a as a red priest, which are the followers of the Lord of Light. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Relor is a god of fire and life. Uh, there is an opposite to him in their faith. A sort of evil god to be fought against. And there's a lot of interesting theories that can be drawn from this other god as it's the great other a god of ice and death 
Hmm. Hmm. A fire and ice, you say? Yes. Hmm. 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 Let's see what's got play here. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, R'hllor is also one of the gods that's most, like, active. As okay. he, he has a tendency to gift powers to some of his followers. He is the only one out here making clerics. Essentially. Inter okay, that's actually kind of interesting. Yeah, uh, like when you're talking about like the old faith and the uh, and the seven, you you didn't really mention anything about like you know like our the D and D cleric type yeah. powers. There is technically a sort of magic associated with the the old gods, but it's not so much cleric as more as a sort of druid. Ah, okay. That that makes more sense. Yeah, but, uh... Yeah. Uh, R'hllor tends to gift his followers with the powers of pyromancy, visions of the future. Hell, he might even resurrect some people. Though the people that come back aren't fully themselves. Yes. Oh. Okay. It's heavily implied that uh, essentially parts of their soul are missing as they come back, stuck in whatever lies beyond. Hmm. Whatever the afterlife actually is in this setting. Yep, and the few characters that have died don't really have much to say about that. As either there is no afterlife, or they just don't remember it. Hmm. Either way, it's a whole lot of mystery yet again. Yes. But... Uh, that sort of brings us to the next god, which also has a bit of a... Well, it's not too much clerics. In, like, comparison, comparing it to D&D, &D, but... They do give some sort of magic to their followers. And that is the many-faced god. Oh, okay. Good. Oh, so that's actually a straight-up other religion. Yep. Hmm. Or, well, uh, the, many, the followers of the many-faced <laughs> god think that, oh yeah, all these other fates, they're all just wor worshipping the many-faced god, they just don't know about it. I kind of uh, like that. Huh. Yep. Uh, the many-faced god is a god of death. Which is mainly worshipped by a cult of shape-shifting assassins. Okay, now I'm remembering the whole place that... Uh, crap, what was her name? Arya. Ar Arya? Arya goes off to? Yeah, uh, in... their mainly worshipped by the faceless men that have their headquarters in the uh, House of White and Black in Bravos. Mm. And, uh, yeah, they get the power to sort of shapeshift from their god. And they use that to be assassins. They're expensive as all hell, but you know they're you're paying for quality. <laughs> of course. Uh, beyond that, we don't really know much about them. They also sort of run a bit of a funeral service at their temple, as they are a <laughs> god of death. So. Okay. Yep. Generally um, kind of keep rather cloaked about what they're actually doing. Exactly. Uh, and then the final god I want to, or re religious belief I want to talk about is uh, 
the religion they worship on the Iron Islands. Oh yeah, you mentioned the whole Eldritch bit. All of a sudden, out of the blue. Hey, you want some Lovecraft in your setting? Here. Yeah, uh, the Drowned God. Oh, that sounds promising. Yeah, uh, not much is known about this belief. Again, it's very heavily implied to be some sort of Lovecraftian Elder God. Hmm. Uh, and it's hmm. also possible that one of the characters in the book is trying to awaken that Elder God to destroy the world. Oh, okay. All right, GRM. You just kind of throw... <laughs> Again, just toss that out through us and be like, yeah, this is a thing. Let's get, get back to the story now, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, I mean, plus the, the character that might be trying to do that is also one of like the creepiest characters in the book. Oh, I mean, suitably so. Yeah, uh, mm. just like a quick detail about, or two quick detail about that character. Uh, his ship is called the Silence. Cool As, ship name. <laughs> yep. And it's called that... Well, first of all, it's rumored that all people as part of his crew are his own bastard children. Oh. oh I'm, I mean, that's a way to get a crew, I guess. <laughs> yep. And secondly, the reason that it's called the Silence is... Uh, he has cut out all of their tongues so they cannot share his secrets. Okay, alright. That's... One, that is creepy as heck. Two, ha. Huh. Yep. Ha. Huh. I mean, you... What, so this, so you're telling me this, this one man has decided to round up every bastard child he has fathered and then it's like, alright, you serve me now. Deal with it. Also, cutting off your tongue. Yep. <laughs> and hi, Techno! Yes, perfect timing. <laughs> oh. Yeah, perfect timing indeed. And also, but the man that cuts off the tongues of his bastard children to make them work on his ship, yes. <laughs> yeah, uh... Euron Greyjoy is, uh... A very creepy man in the books. Compared to in, hmm. in the show. Yeah, I, I was, like, trying to, like, did this come up in the show at all? I I feel like something like this would, like, have left its mark on my memory. Uh, the character technically appears in the show in Season 5, but they they changed him a lot. Hmm, I see. They were like, uh, do we want to do we wanna do this whole bit? They're cowards, yep. clearly. Uh, but, yeah, uh, it, it, I think it was, uh... The reason this uh, faith is had there on the Iron Islands was uh, a pirate fell off his ship, and as he was drowning, he had had these visions guiding him to uh, the uh, the main island, Pike. And when he woke up, he was on the shores. And as he walked up, like, the cliffs, there was just this stone throne up on, like, one of the high, highest cliffs there. Oh, that's not suspect at all. Oh. Yep. So, uh, <laughs> that is just a little bit about the gods. So we've got druidic shamanism... More complicated version of Christianity. Fire and flames. Who knows what the heck is going on with the mystery man of many faces. And then Eldritch. El a fathomless one, basically. Yeah. It, it's, I mean, a lot of, the joke a lot of people is making about the drowned god is Cthulhu. <laughs> I mean, for good reason. Yeah. It, it's definitely something fishy there. Very, very fishy. Yes. Oh. Uh, Again, I, of all things, uh, uh, another one on the things I did not expect. It's just for there to be eldritch stuff. Just suddenly out of the blue. 
Understandable. Alongside the cat people. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, there, there's gonna be a few more curveballs. I feel like. Oh boy. <laughs> so now we get. Oh yeah, I put this in. Oh, I put this in before. I forgot that. Uh, I want to uh, discuss some factions, real quick. Uh, it, it's mainly three very important factions. Okay. Uh, and the first one is the Night's Watch. Ah, yes, the boys up north. Yes, the crows. Mm. They were founded during a period of time called the Long Night. I will get into that as well later. Okay, and okay. one of their founding members uh, is Man... Referred to as the last hero. It is believed he was the founder of the Night's Watch. Interesting title as well. The last hero. There's also some other theories that may connect him to certain prophecies. But I'll get more into that when we get to uh, actually talking about the Long Night. Hmm. Uh, All right. Of course, they have guarded the wall for millennia. Originally, specifically from uh, <clears throat> a certain race of ancient ice demons. But as those fell more into myth, it became more, uh, let's just protect this wall from any threats from beyond. <laughs> yep, the barbarian tribes up north there. Yeah, the, the barbarian tribes are just Unlucky to live in this frozen wasteland. <laughs> uh, um, unfortunately, they are rather uh, poorly manned. As uh, it it used to be seen as an honorable profession. It used to be seen as you know doing a great duty. So. They had a lot. Used to have a lot of volunteers. Mm-hmm. Now, and then they, somewhere along the line, it just kind of turned into what it is now with yeah, the whole crime criminals. Yeah, exactly. Where it's more of a punishment because I I do think that has a lot to do with the again the certain ice demons fading more into uh, myth and legend. So it's like ah yes, you want to sit up there in a frozen keep for the rest of your life. Have fun. Hmm. <laughs> do you want to go to prison or do you want to go up there and live sort of free, but you know, you gotta live ah, uh, cause it, in like just a frigid wasteland. <laughs> yep, and also over these three uh, factions I'm gonna cover here there is also the fact that they take very similar vows of renouncing any inheritance they have, taking vows of celibacy, hmm. and, you know, obviously those are sort of things where not everyone is going to be on board. <laughs> Though, out of these three factions, the Night's Watch is the one with the least to offer. <laughs> Yeah, considering that they're not a whole real lot currently, they're just a, essentially just a bunch of criminals sent up north. Yeah, it, it, there's like, oh yeah, at like the time of the books, there's only like a handful of volunteers. Mm. But most, yeah, most of them are like criminals, murderers, rapists, like the scum of the earth. Yep. Uh, so let's turn that to a bit more honorable as we talk about the King's Guard. Mm, yes, quote unquote honorable. Yeah, I mean, yeah, by the time of the books, uh, the that King's Guard, they were also not that honorable, but there's been a once lot. Upon a time. Yeah, I mean, once upon a time, there's been a lot of honorable knights in the King's Guard. 
the King's Guard was created by uh, Aegon the Four, uh, Aegon the First, mainly because his wife Visenya was complaining. He's like, "No, you need fucking bodyguards." <laughs> Can't have you going alone. Yeah, it's essentially, yeah, you're a good warrior, but that's not always going to cut it. <laughs> so, they created the King's Guard, which is this near. Now, also going to point out with the King's Guard. The best knights of the realm, I yes, suppose. The, the best, the greatest knights in the realm, the seven. Greatest Knights of the Realm. That was a specific number of them, yes. too. There are seven of them, and one of them serves as the Lord Commander. Okay. And uh, there's been a lot of legendary knights wearing the white cloaks of the King's Guard. Hmm. I can imagine. Yes, like Sir Eamon the Dragon Knight. Wonder what he's famous for. Ah, yes. Or Sir Barristan Selmy. Or Barristan the Bold. Okay. Sir, The legendary knight Sir Duncan the Tall. And of course, Sir Arthur Dane, the Sword of the Morning. There's a story behind every single one of these names, and oh boy. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, one thing this series does greatly is giving great nicknames and titles to characters. <laughs> like, the Sword of the Morning is just, mm, it's peak. That's a good name. Yep, That's a or, really good name. <laughs> or, you know, there's uh, Sir Davis Seaworth, the Onion Knight. Unexpected on your night. Oh, hello. Yes. Or uh, they expect you out of Final I've been a place aside from Final Fantasy <laughs> 3. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Or uh there is uh from the short story The Hedge Knight, The Laughing Storm. Ooh, that's again, these are all such good names. Yep. Just I'll explain that one just real quick here. Uh, the Laughing Storm, Lionel Baratheon, had a tendency during tourneys to, uh, because in, at least Game of Thrones, in tourneys, the knights wear these big emblems on their helmets. Like, uh, a knight of House Lannister would have, a, like, a big lion on their helmet. Or a knight of House Arryn would have a giant eagle. And uh, Lionel Lionel Baratheon would always try and knock that off into the crowd. And <laughs> while he did, he was laughing like a madman. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hence why the laughing storm. Oh, I like that a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and... Uh... It's also very important to note, but uh, just uh, an important thing to note about the King's Guard is different regions have had their own versions of the King's Guard, like uh, Renly, uh, a character in the books, Renly Baratheon. When mm -hmm. he sort of like names himself king, he makes his own sort of variation of the King's Guard, which he calls the Rainbow Guard, where like each member. Gets like differently colored armor, like, uh, I think I, I forget the character's name, but he wears like pure red armor. Ooh, ooh, okay, I like that image. <laughs> and one like wears like a lot. one wears blue armor, one wears indigo armor. Uh, and I mean, it sort of ties back to. I mean, the fact that there are seven members ties back to the Faith of the Seven. Mm. And, okay, yeah. And it's also kind of there, like the Rainbow, in the Rainbow Guard of Renly. 
it's also a not so subtle hint to the reader that Renly is gay. Oh my god. <laughs> very unsubtle indeed. Okay. Yeah, that one's very on the nose. <laughs> Okay, GRM. Uh, not what I expected from you, but all right. Uh, Neat. And uh, the the last sort of faction I want to talk about here uh, is the Order of the Maesters. Oh yes, the. Uh... Now I'm trying to remember. I was like, oh yes, those guys. I remember nothing about them. Crap. <laughs> yeah, they're uh. Order of Scholars. Uh, they're... Have their sort of, like, he organization, like, headquarters is called the Citadel, is, and it's in Old Town. It's where they teach new initiates. They... A lot of the grand ma or archmaesters are the higher ranking members of the order, and uh, yeah, they study a wide variety of topics from history and medicine and economics, and mm -hmm. yeah, they're, they're a bit of everything from like yeah, like healers and doctors to historians. So just academics in general. Yeah. And uh, the most defining feature is they wear these chains around their necks. And every link in the chain represents a field they have studied. And as such, mm. what type of metal that link is made of represents the field. Like, I think it's gold for economics. And it's like iron for history and all of these variety of topics. And uh, one of their things you can study at uh, the Citadel is what they refer to as the higher mysteries. Hmm. It's essentially learning, like... The theoretics of magic. Okay. Interesting. So these this group also knows a bit about magic. Okay. Yeah, but but they hate magic. Because they're oh. ver they're very much like Yeah, they're this is a world of science. Magic has no place in it. But they're also kind of studying about it at the same time too. Yep. It's a bit the way of like they're studying it to uh, sort of disprove it. Like, oh yes, no, this is an actual magic. Uh, look at this. Here's the here's the pure own explanation for this particular phenomenon. Yep. Uh, but there's also the fact that the current head of that field of study. <laughs> Is all in on magic, and of course, <laughs> yeah, he's like. So people like jokingly or like mockingly refer to him as the wizard. Oh my goodness! As but he, I mean, he is pretty knowledgeable about the different forms of magic and knowledge about it. <laughs> so just to hear a bit of a aside, how about I teach you a little about a little bit about the different kinds of magic? Okay. All uh, right. th this is a bit off the cuff. A uh, bit off the cuff uh, so I and I don't have a specific like slide for this, but I, again magic takes a variety of different forms in this world. There's the magic mm. found within the followers of the Lord of Light, uh, which is uh, yeah, some visions of the future, 
some fire magic, uh, and some light resurrection every now and then. Hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, there's the shadow magic from a shy. Where uh, it's very vague, but uh, like you mentioned earlier, we kind of get a scene of that uh, in the show. <laughs> oh, yes, the, the, the demon killer thing, baby yes. thing. <laughs> uh, huh. And then there is the uh, Valerian magic, which is, as far as we know, tied to two things, which is being able to bond with dragons... Okay. And what they refer to as dragon dreams. Dragon dreams. It, it's okay. essentially uh, prophetic dreams. That's. Hmm. Some Targaryens can do this. But I'm, I'm going to tell you right now the problem with the prophecy and seeing having visions of the future in this. In this setting, it's Vegas all hell. Of course. Could it just be straightforward? It, it's vague as all hell and leaves a lot up to interpretation. So, a lot of people, like Melisandre, she's off doing things based, of her vis based on her visions, but there's a lot of her just... Assuming things. <laughs> uh, she's a she's a she just she just believes in what she needs to believe in. Yeah. And the sort of final part of magic that I want to refer uh, get to here is uh, the magic found in the north, mainly among the descendants of the first men. Okay. Skin changing. Oh, well, just just straight up shape shifting. Not really shape shifting. It's called skin changing. It also referred to as warging. Oh, okay. And now, it, uh, now I get it. <laughs> and it's essentially the ability to possess animals. Hmm. Wait, is this where the whole term warging came from? Or is it somewhere else? I don't know. Because, <laughs> like, I, I, I get the term warging because I've said it many a times, like, playing, like, characters that have, like, familiars and all such. Yeah, just gonna warg into this, into my little bird here. I might be, but... Uh, I do not know. <laughs> hmm. Uh, and hmm. then a rare few among the skin changers are green seers. Not only right. can they warg, but they can also have visions of the future or of the past. Ah, yes, more visions. Yep. And they can also possess people. Oh, oh okay, just straight up possession. Just take control of somebody. Take him for a ride. <laughs> yeah, uh, and that's kind of why when it gets to one of the green series I'm actually going to discuss later, people think he might be up to some eugenics shit. Excuse me? Yeah, that, that's uh, a, <laughs> it's a fan theory <laughs> that, like, is this guy possibly manipulating things? So, like, the right like person becomes king so the right bloodline can continue and then this person can be born like a hundred years later oh again I'm, you were saying curveballs but I did not expect eugenics as a curveball here <laughs> surprise oh okay another surprise thing. surprise eugenics yes uh, I mean I kind of as terrible as it is to kind of say it, I, it's an interesting and cool idea, but also, what the heck. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> uh. Okay, I like the comp... Okay, again, everything I see about this is going to sound so bad. But I like the, 
the, just the idea that like oh that's just messed up though <laughs> yes <laughs> like a lot of things in this world hmm quite uh but oh, i forgot to add the fade in on the text but yes now we get to uh the races of the world a again there are like cat people i would have put them here but could not find yeah, good barely, not, barely any info on them yeah i could not find good references on them good sources on them so if i could have there though yep they're there uh if i could have found good sources on them i probably would just put in like a picture of a tabaxi here <laughs> for him <laughs> got no uh, other reference yes uh so of course we have humans of course yeah the most common uh race you'll see yeah uh oh i forgot i put this in here uh we got giants oh yes just just big guys yeah. up north yeah giants uh they live beyond the wall now big strong people uh Yeah, I feel like I don't really need to explain giants. Mm -hmm. No, not really. People Pretty know what giants are. Yeah. Uh, then we have these things. What in God's name are you? These are what's okay. referred to as the children of the forest. They are... So, okay. A sort of like nature race... They're like, sort of like fairy like. Huh. That used to inhabit. So, oh, Sarkon. So, like, fey, but not quite fey. Yeah, they're fey, but. Take, like, fey, but take away the, the sort of, like, trickster aspect of them. Hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, and they used to inhabit Westeros before. Humans showed up and fucked shit up. As humans do. Yeah. Uh, they they were the ones who taught humans the faith of the old gods. They were the ones that sort of introduced magic to the humans in the form of uh, skin changing and green seers. Oh. oh. Okay. And they did it first. They were at first at war with humans. With the first men that arrived. But uh, that sort of changed when uh, a common enemy arose. Some, some icy boys. Yes. The others. Hmm. A race of ancient ice demons from the lands of Forever Winter. Huh, so when it comes down, because, like, again, my knowledge of the others, or the... Are these the same as the White Walkers, or are they a whole other kind of situation it, with it's, the White Walkers? It's the same as the White Walkers. They are the White Walkers. Uh, it's just, in the books, they are more commonly referred to as the others. Okay, I see. And the White, wa White Walkers is just another name for them. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, though... They are very differently depicted in the show compared to the books. Mm, and, yeah, I was gonna say with this like drawing here, it's like, huh? That is that's why I was kind of questioning. It's like, are they the same as the White Walkers, or are they, huh? Yeah, because yeah, that is very different. Yeah, because in the show they're very much depicted as uh, like almost undead looking, mm -hmm. while in the books they are very much described as. Uh, there's also a bit of fate aspects to them as they're very much described as ethereal and very sort of like ethereally beautiful uh, with cold pale skin like milk glowing bright blue eyes oh I I'm kind of disappointed the show didn't try to go with that kind of imagery. Yeah. And I I'm kind of sad. I wish I could find a better picture, especially how they're depicted in, like, the graphic novel to put here. 
Oh, because I didn't know if there was a graphic novel. Yeah, uh, they got <laughs> they adapted it into graphic novels. Uh, I don't know how far. I think at least, uh, or comic books and graphic novels. But I think the f- first two books, uh, A Game of Thrones and The Clash of Kings, are out in graphic novel form. I own the first volume for the for for it or for game a game of thrones and yeah hmm. they're they're very again ethereal looking uh, which is why i refer to them as sort of like ice demons rather than sort of like ice zombies yeah no uh, i i get that and honestly Again, it's like it just feels a lot more cooler than the whole like ice zombie thing that yeah. the show was doing with them. Yeah, exactly. And uh, here's also the sort of connection with uh, the Lord of Light I was referring to earlier, where some people see this as, oh yeah, this could be connected to this sort of great other the followers of the Lord of Light want to fight against. Ah, uh, as makes sense. Yep. As, oh yeah, obviously as well. Can raise the dead. Hmm. Hence the zombies. Exactly. Uh, and uh, uh, there is a story I could tell here, but I feel like uh, I'm gonna leave that out here, and uh, I'll explain to you after, like outside of the stream. Okay. Okay. I mean, there's plenty to say. Yes. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, especially since uh, we still haven't gone to like the timeline part of this. Oh boy, <laughs> timelines, my favorite. Yep. Sweats, sweats, and forty k and fate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it actually, I think this for the start of the timeline. Yes, as I talk about the long night. Yeah, I've, I've again that term has been thrown around so much, but it's like what actually is it the long night was something that happened about eight thousand years before the start of the book of uh, the first book of game of thrones Hmm. it is referred to as an apocalyptic winter and night that lasted for decades years would go Without the sun ever racing. So it's just eternal night in the winter. Well, yes. Not eternal, but like... It's in the name. It is it is quite literally in the name. <laughs> yeah. People was born, lived, and died without ever seeing sunlight. And it was during this time the others came and fought... The living. Now, we don't know what cost the long night. Hmm. As again, in over in like Essos and Yt, they believe it's the Bloodstone Emperor that unleashed the long night upon the world. Oh, yes, that guy that, that has a very suspect name indeed, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh in others like again the the, the followers of the Lord of Light think it's the Great Other coming, or... There's just a bunch of things where, ah, yes, we don't know what this is. But here's a bunch of theories. Here's a lot of things that could have caused this whole thing. Yeah. Hmm. And it was during this... War, or the fight with the others, that the hu- the first men, at least in Westeros, joined together with the giants and the children of the forest to fight back. Hmm. I mean, makes sense, considering yeah. the grave threat to the whole world that the others seem to have po- poised at this point. Also, something else that I feel like it's very important to talk about with the setting of this world is how seasons work. 
Oh yeah, because the whole thing of like that winter is that the seasons are more so like years rather than yeah, like a few months that we have in our world. Exactly. It, instead of having like autumn, spring, winter, and summer, it's just winter and summer, and they can instead of just lasting months, they last for years. I was always kind of curious about like. Like, my brain, like, could not ever really wrap itself around that whole concept of, like, so how does just anything, like, crop or growing-wise work in that case? It's just, you just keep on growing and growing and growing until winter hits. Yep. I mean, I got, got to imagine that's what they do, especially, but, I mean, that leaves them being able to stock up quite a bit, though. That's true. We can stock up for years for the whoever knows however long many years the winter will be. Yeah. So also imagine how nice it would be a summer that lasts for like five years. Yeah, it's true, but then you gotta deal with a winter that lasts like five years and uh, True. Oh, oh <laughs> that's a terrifying thought. Yep. Uh but there's also here uh the great or the last hero comes in again fighting the uh, the, the white walkers and found, uh, f- possibly founding the night's watch at least being Thank a part you. of it hmm. yep you you make a good point there senry if we can get like a nice you know properly like <laughs> hot summer where it's like you know comfortably hot yeah where you can you know walk down the street and not need to wear like a jet you can just walk down the street in like shorts and a t-shirt and you're fine but yeah like the good kind of summer not the exactly not the, like i do i want to die every single day summer yeah exactly not the kind of summer when you're laying on your on your couch melting away in the summer heat uh, but there is also a very intriguing or interesting lore part over in Essos where tied to the followers of the Lord of Light oh okay as a hero arises to fight the great evil in the night named Azora High Why does his name sound like I've heard it before? Melisandre says it a lot. Ah, that that would explain it. <laughs> yep, and because she's working with uh, the prophecy of uh, Asura High Reborn. But hmm. Asura High wielded a magical sword called Lightbringer. It was said to burn with fire. And he is said to have defeated the great evil and brought the dawn. Now, there are theories that Asura High and the last hero are the same character. Or the okay. same person as uh in one of the books it's mentioned that oh yeah last the last here here's a writing about the last hero finding a way to uh defeat the White Walkers. Hmm. But again, it's one of those things of we don't truly know how it ended. It just it just did. Yep, I, somehow. It, it's one of those things where I think we're gonna get we're probably gonna get an answer maybe. in the like the next book, maybe. But who knows yeah. when that's coming out? <laughs> who knows indeed in how many years? <laughs> yep. Will we ever know? Who knows? Yep. And of course it ends when... Or after it ends, Brand the Builder builds just... Somehow makes a giant magical ice wall. He just does. Yeah, somehow... <laughs> Just okay, cool. Uh, huge ice. I, I cast 
I wall of ice at tenth level. <laughs> with permanence, with permanence meta magic on it too. Yes. And it hey, again, it's one of those things like, fuck if I know how he did it, but somehow he did. Um, how he made this wall. Yep. Oh yeah, just I just remembered another part, <laughs> just real quick about the uh, the others. Mm-hmm. They ride giant ice spiders. Well, that's terrifying. Yes. <laughs> oh, thanks. I hate it. Uh, yep. A little extra piece of uh, horrifying to this uh, scary pie. Uh, like they weren't terrifying enough already. Exactly. Uh, so. Ah, yes. Little break time. <laughs> yes, here is the break time. Uh, if someone needs to go to the bathroom, uh, get something to drink. It is also. I'll... Oh, sorry, I think Ron. I'll take that. Yep. Uh, and it is also at this point uh, I will be answering questions from anyone who has any. <laughs> I'll be I'll be right back in a minute or I'm right. thinking about the ice spiders. <laughs> <laughs> Understandable. Cause I, yeah, because I, I don't think did they ever no, those I don't remember seeing that in the show. Yeah. Not it, that we ever really got not that season four really got far into like the whole plot line with the others yet, as far as I remember. Yeah. It, it's mentioned like once by uh uh, old Nan, who is, like, a caretaker at Winterfell. Hmm. Uh, but she mentally, basically just mentions it, yeah, to scare Bran. Oh my goodness. <laughs> if you don't be careful there, young young one, the spider, the ice spiders will get you. <laughs> yeah, the, the White Walkers will, came, will come on their giant ice spiders and fucking kill you. <laughs> Oh, man. All right, I'm going to go to the washroom, so I'll be back in a minute. Yeah, all right. Uh, of course, uh, I will be uh, taking questions, as I said. Uh, that does include from uh, anyone watching who might be curious about anything I've been talking about. Uh Uh, anyone who wants to uh, Uh, no more, you know? And this is uh, the time to ask. I mean, uh, I'll be right back. I'm just going to go get another drink. And of course, uh, if there are any questions, I'll happily answer them when I get back. back to talk about this uh, well interesting series <laughs> as we Ah, oh, 
But how is everyone doing while we wait? Again, I do hope uh, you're finding this interesting. Uh, I couldn't find as many memes to throw in here when uh, compared to when I did the uh, Warhammer 40k one, but uh, Warhammer 40k memes are a thing of their own. I get back, and the first thing I hear on putting on my headphones is 40k memes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, uh, just because <laughs> when I did uh, the Warhammer 40k lore lecture, I put in so many memes. I mean, that's fair. 40k is just a hotbed of memes. Yes. Uh... But actually, I, I do have a question I thought of while I was at the loo here. Ah, yes, uh, where were the dragons in all of this long night business? That's the thing. That's not really fully been explained. Probably around the area of Valeria? Because that's where dragons have generally been found historically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'd have thought that like there'd be like a bigger factor about the dragons and the whole, uh, you know, the whole world is in ice and darkness now, so, you know, yep. maybe I've got to need some fire here. Yep, and uh, uh, thank you for the stretch, posture check, and hydrate fish. <clears throat> Will well, do. Yeah. Ugh. Uh. Right. One theory I've seen about where the dragons were during all that is uh, that the dragon dragon's eggs just hadn't hatched yet. So that there were no dragons around that time. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, I suppose that makes sense to explain some things of why they aren't actively mentioned, because it seems like, you know, if the dragons were like a big part of like Fighting off the long night, it would have been mentioned. Yeah. Like, that would have been, like, a big part of, I suppose, Valeria's, like, kind of telling of what had happened. Yep. Uh, yeah, self-care time. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that could be the case, or, again, it's either that the other hung out just around the area of Valeria... Or that they weren't hatched yet. Uh, because... Yeah, dragon's eggs, if they don't hatch, are just like giant stones. Ah. Okay. And, uh, I mean... Uh, there's a point in the story where there's like... Almost 200 years where no new dragons are hatched. Hmm. So it is possible that just there were just no dragons around at that point, but hmm, I don't know. Okay, it's a lot of uh, it's a big old question mark. Yes, uh, but now it is time to move into the next point. Okay, okay. Wait, ah. Oh, I forgot one here. Or maybe I... Uh oh. Yep. Uh I thought I put one it more in... thing before we get onto it. Uh did I put it in the wrong place? No. We've got an important piece of lore missing from the tapestry here. Oh yeah, I think what it was is just I couldn't find any good pr pictures to represent that time point while I was looking at uh -huh. and then I just for accidentally forgot about it. Oh dear. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we can use the break time. Essentially, it's uh, what's referred to as the Age of Heroes. Oh, that sounds familiar. Yeah, good. It's a 
good 8,000 years between uh, the end of the long night before... <laughs> up, leading up to, like, eh, Aegon's conquest. Hmm, okay. Uh, and we got a lot of things happening here. We got uh, the Andal invasion from... Uh, well, they were coming in from Essos, uh, led by Artis, e Artis Aaron. Uh, a lot of uh, of the great houses were founded during this time, like uh, Garth Greenhand finding founding House Gardener, Artis Aaron founds House Aaron, and Len the Clever founding mm -hmm. or yeah creating House Lannister by somehow. Okay. So okay, uh. Originally, Casterly Rock was ruled over by a house, by a family called Casterly. Okay. Land Clever somehow got them out and took control of Casterly Rock. Mm. It is somehow unknown how he did this, with theories ranging from everything from. He just married into the family and took over to s somehow swindling them out of their inheritance. We don't know. There's just a lot of stories about it. Yeah, to sneaking in and killing everyone in the middle of the night. Oh, jeez. <laughs> to... Just going into full-on sexual assault. Oh my goodness. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and we don't know which one it is. <laughs> it's a whole big old question mark. All right. Neat. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, the the Roynar ar arriving in Dorne led by Princess Nymeria. After they were fleeing from the Valerians. Hmm. Uh, and it was actually there she married a prince of House Martell and joined their two houses together to rule Dorne. And uh, it's actually... Uh, the original symbol of House Martell was a spear, and Nymeria's symbol was a sun. And now, the symbol of House Martell is... A spear going through a sun at oh. oh my god, Ayumi! Thank you for the raid! Uh. Oh, hello! Raiders, welcome in! <laughs> Thank you so much! Oh. Welcome, welcome! Oh my god, uh, I need to. Uh, shout out Ayumi. <laughs> ah, yes. Uh, of course. Thank you. Welcome in Raiders. And, uh... Switching accents. Oh, goodness. <laughs> yes. Oh, good <laughs> lord. Uh, how, how are you doing, Ayumi? I saw you were playing uh, some Dead by Daylight. Uh, how did that go? <laughs> uh, but, uh, alright. <clears throat> Let's... Continue this as a uh, good old British accent. <clears throat> oh, all right. Oh. Yes. Uh... Oh, I see. This is what we're doing here then. Oh yes. Uh... <clears throat> oh yes. Very, very good. Ah, <laughs> uh... uh, I see. Uh, that's unfortunate to hear. Uh... I'm sorry to hear that. Uh... In the troubles can be so annoying. But, uh, yeah, it's good to hear you're doing good at least. Indeed, indeed. Uh, yeah, welcome in. Uh, we're doing a law lecture. I'm teaching uh, Osric here about Game of Thrones law. 
how all the knowledge so much so many things i did not expect to be quite honest <laughs> yes uh, everything from uh uh <laughs> surprise eugenics to <laughs> surprise uh, eugenics cat people uh there's an eldritch gods kind of just there yes there's a lot of strange things uh and uh, of course we have the uh, during this time of the Age of Heroes, we also have the the rise of the Valerian Freehold, which is the the Valerian Empire. Mm, yes, which, the Valerian has been talked about so much as this whole thing of legend in the past. Yes, uh, to sort of scroll back to the uh, yeah, on the map. So the Valerian Peninsula was, you know, once a whole peninsula. And uh, there is yes, once, once upon a time, <laughs> yes, and what they once ruled like most of Essos. The empire was big. Okay, like pretty much covered a good chunk of Essos. Yes, and uh, of course the biggest thing was. The people who ruled was known as dragon lords. People with the magical ability to bond with dragons and become dragon riders. And of course, them having dragons was a pretty big advantage over other, like, smaller civilizations. Oh, that probably helped with establishing the empire, you know? Yeah. Aerial superiority and all such. There was also the fact that, uh, they developed a way of smithing steel, creating Valyrian steel. Okay, so what is the special thing about it? Because, you know, it's like, oh, this blade is made of Valyrian steel, so it's like, and it just also has all, it's like, what is this big deal about it? Is it just steel, or is there something else about it? Well, there's, uh, the main properties of Valyrian steel compared to normal steel is it's Nigh indestructible. All right. It has the an incredible ability to retain an edge. Remaining, it can a sword can stay in its sheath for centuries and still be sharp enough to shave with. Okay. Okay. There's also the fact that uh, Valyrian steel can be used to kill. White Walkers. Ah. Uh, just uh, somehow. <laughs> yes. Magic. <laughs> uh, and it's also lightweight. It's much lighter than normal steel. So was this like just a technique or the material or some sort of like maybe magic or... Possibly magic? We don't know, because this information, this knowledge was lost with the fall of Valyria. <laughs> oh yes, let's get on to that. How is, why is this not a peninsula anymore? Why is it an archipelago? That's another thing we don't really know. <laughs> oh, lovely. <laughs> we just know that it's not something terrible happened to you. Yeah, uh, all the images we've seen of it in like official art just shows like a gigantic volcanic eruption. I wonder what this is referencing. Yes, uh, there was also probably a lot of some magic involved, considering, you know, the peninsula is fucking destroyed. Yeah, it's kind of just full on shattered here. Hmm. So, and uh, most of the Valerian noble houses were lost. A lot of the. Uh, Valyrian dragon riders died, a lot of the dragons died. And of course, the knowledge of how to make uh, Valyrian steel was lost. There are still a few blacksmiths all around the world who knows how to work with Valyrian steel, but they can't make it. Meaning, if you can get them some Valyrian steel, they can reforge it for you, but... Not much else. 
I mean, fair. What with all the techniques being lost when Valyria went boom? Yes. Uh, the two there were two main noble houses that were able to escape. These are two, of course, being House Targaryen and House Velaryon. Both settling on. Uh, see, can I get yeah here? It's very faint here. You see mm -hmm. Dragonstone here, and then this here is a drift mark. Okay. And what these two islands used to be was old Valyrian trading outposts. Mm, so they just kind of fled over there the moment Valyria went boom. A little bit before they were kind of exiled. Oh. Because one of their okay. ancestors might have gone a bit crazy having visions about the fall of Valyria. Ah, huh. well, maybe they should have listened to that a little bit more. Mm. Eh, it's like uh, Cassandra of Troy. Who needs to listen ah. to prophecy? Yeah, prophecy is all pish posh. <laughs> yeah, so uh, let's move back to the right position now. There we go. As we get to Aegon's Conquest. Hmm. Which uh, is the start of the calendar they use. Calendar system. Uh, which okay. is uh, uh, with the start of Aegon's Conquest being the year zero. Hmm. Good to know that's where that all starts off. Yeah. Um, so, Aegon... Well, it's actually unknown why Aegon decided to conquer. There are theories... And uh, the newest show, House of the Dragon, certainly introduces an interesting sort of reason why, but it's also one of those things of, hey, this is one of the shows, we don't know if it's canon to the books. But he decides that he need, he wants to conquer this continent. So he gathers his men his allies of House Valerion, and sets out from Dragonstone. Landing in what's now known as Crownlands, and of course where he landed, the they built great fortif a great fortification, which would one day become King's Landing. Mm. And ah, I, right. I do think that's also a good point to switch back to my normal accent after nine minutes. Ah, there we go. There we go. Now, uh... Aegon! There were three Targaryen uh, dragon riders around this time. Uh, which was Aegon, and then his two wives, Visenya and Rhaenys. Hmm. Who were both also his sisters, by the way. Ah, yes, here we go. Here's the incest. Yeah, I actually thought of a fun joke here to compare. To, like, anime. Oh, no. <laughs> he couldn't decide between the Onesan and the Yamoto, so he said both. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, no. oh, God. I, I kind of like that, but I also hate it. <laughs> yes. Uh, Aegon's, Aegon's dragon is actually... Uh, the oldest dragon to have lived during the time of the Targaryens. And also, who grew to be the biggest dragon. Oh. Uh, and his name was Beleriand the Black Dread. Again, if there's one thing GRRM does well, it's just giving good names and titles. Yep. Uh, and, uh, yeah, he went around... To different regions, fighting the different lords. Or sometimes not fighting. Sometimes with the... Uh, King Heron the Black of uh, the Isles of ri and Rivers. He has roasted him inside his keep. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> and uh, oh. that keep is Hall that I kind of mentioned earlier that is seen as cursed because oh that one yeah that anyone place. 
Anyone who owns it dies a horrible death. So much so, this curse is so well known that in the main books there's a character that's like, Ah yes, ah yes, I'll be given a noble title and land. And as soon as someone brings up, it's like, oh yeah, we'll give you her we'll give you her Heron Hall if you don't do what we say. It's like, oh no, please, anything but Heron Hall, just because everyone knows of its curse. Uh, but we have uh, Torn Stark, the king in the north, who willingly knelt to. Aegon Targaryen, which is actually what we have depicted here on the screen. Hmm. Uh, it is said that uh, Torrin sent his brother to meet with Aegon to find a way for peace, and then just, okay, cool, yeah, I'll just bend the knee. Ah, okay. Interesting, and I didn't realize that the, the Starks were like the first ones to be like, hey, Let's be allies. Let's let's not fight. Yeah, I mean, it's the thing of the well, allies is less allies. I I I'd say in this case they more became like vassals. I yep. assume. I mean, one thing that's very important to take note of in all history throughout Westeros is how Stark is almost always the most reasonable ones. Hmm. They are. If a character. If there's an important character from House Stark somewhere, like, eight times out of ten, they're gonna be the voice of reason. Oh, yes. Uh, I mean, yeah. you always gotta have that one in there in the midst of all of this madness, considering everything going on in this whole setting. Yeah. Uh, then we have... Uh, I would... Uh, I would uh, yeah, the Battle of the, F the Fields of Fire, where Myrne Gardner and Lauren Lannister lost. Myrne Gardner dying, and Lauren Lannister surrendering. Oh, neat. Yep. Uh, you have, uh, in the Stormlands, uh, as I mentioned earlier, where the founder of House Baratheon, Oris Baratheon, Aegon's half-brother... Showed up, beat the shit of Ar Argilac uh, Durandon, took his land, took his symbol, and took his daughter. He's again just, just establishing dominance as the most outright form he can manage. Yep, and yes, Krellon, people die when they are killed. <laughs> people die when they are killed. Got yep. That sure. Uh, but despite, after all of this, there was still one region that refused to yield. Dorne. Oh, interesting. Of all places. Yep. Uh, Dorne at the time was ruled over by Princess Maria Martell. A blind, balding 80-year-old woman known as the Yellow Toad. And not what I expected. All right. <laughs> yep. Uh. Oh wait. No, I for I forgot actually one. Oh. Uh, which is Ronald Aaron. Uh, how what happened to him in the King of the Vale? Uh, he was a young boy whose mother ruled as regent. And essentially, Visenya Targaryen showed up, took Ronald on a dragon flight. And then when she came back down, just went to uh, Shara Aaron, Ronald's mother, and went, Yeah, it would have been really easy for me to just throw him off while I was flying up there. <laughs> and, and she's like, I could have done this to you. You could have. Probably should have. Yep, I could have done this. And I will do that. <laughs> if you don't join... If you don't do what we say, I will do it. <laughs> uh, uh. But, yeah, uh, back to Dorne. They refused to yield. And uh, 
they fought with a lot of uh, guerrilla tactics. Stealth and subterfuge, ambushes. And they even managed to kill Rhaenys Targaryen and her dragon Meraxes. Hmm. Man. Okay, just the feat of being able to take down a dragon is always, you know... Oh, yeah. No matter the setting, impressive. Yep. But this sort of... angered Aegon... <laughs> even more just also a very important note about Aegon and his again relationship to his sisters <laughs> it is said he married Visenya out of duty and Rhaenys out of love huh well then uh, again, really, really could have picked between the two <laughs> yeah uh, again it's mm, it's surprising none of these have the Habsburg jaw <laughs> Uh, let us let us not introduce genetics to our fantasy world. Although the talk of the guy doing eugenics apparently means, uh, yep, a whole other factor of that in there too. So it's like, hmm. Hmm. uh, yep. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, eventually, Aegon received a letter from uh af the uh, Martell who ruled after Maria. And it essentially just, no one knows what the letter said, but it was something where, that led to, uh, Aegon calling for a ceasefire. Hmm. Oh, alright. One of the main- Not what I expected, but, huh. Yep. One of the main theories was that, ah yes, Rhaenys is alive when we have her captive, is like one of the main theories. Okay. But- yeah, we will never know. It's just another mystery. Yep. Uh, Dorne would eventually join the rest of the Seven Kingdoms eventually. But uh, there was many years, especially many years of war between that. Took a bit of time. Yeah, exactly. But... Here we actually get to, uh, so I mentioned to you before we started that there was some things that were giving me massive headaches when it comes came to this. Ah, oh, yes, you did mention that. Yep. Uh, here's the other part. The Targaryen dynasty. Ah, <laughs> here we go. So, uh, on screen here we have, uh, all of the Targaryen kings that ruled between 1 AC and 283 AC. Okay. Over a, a span of 283 years, they had 17 kings ruling. Wait, 200? Wait, hold on a moment here. <laughs> huh. Oh, wait, you said 283 years. Yep. 17 kings. Huh. So, like, on average, it's like, can I do math? <laughs> can I do math in my brain? I know I'm I can't. I'm good at math. Same. I know I, I, I certainly can't either, but those are awfully short reigns for the majority of them. Oh, yeah. Like, the one who ruled for the longest... Ruled for 55 years. Hmm. And there's one and of them... that takes up... <laughs> and that takes up, like, a good chunk of that whole yep. period. There's one of them that ruled for only one. Mm -hmm. uh, but, of I'm course... late Roman Empire vibes from this. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, the first... The thing about the Targaryen dynasty that gave me so many headaches for this is... First of all, so much fucking incest. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. can imagine. Again, it's the whole thing of when the family tree becomes a family circle, it something's fucking wrong. Mm. 
Something's very wrong indeed. Yep. Oh boy. <laughs> uh, secondly, it's the fact that they keep reusing the same names or variations of the same names over and over again. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> just as a reference here, this up here is Aegon the First, Aegon the Conqueror. Down here, okay. this is Aegon the Fifth. Ah, uh, okay. Lovely reused names. We love those. <laughs> yep. But, uh, let's go through this sort of line of succession here. Okay, okay. Of course, we have Aegon the First, the Conqueror, mm -hmm. the one who started this dynasty. Yep. After him, we have his uh, oldest son, Aenys, who was the son of uh, Rhaenys. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, Aenys the First Targaryen. Oh, yeah, also, just forgot to mention uh, Aegon the Conqueror ruled from 1 AC after conquest. To 37 AC. And uh, after his death, his son Aenys, the first Targaryen, ruled uh, from 37 AC to 42 AC. Also, uh, <laughs> I have included everyone's nicknames here. And uh, okay. the, the only nickname I could find for Aenys was King Abomination. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> What the hell did he do? Yeah, I, I think it's just incest and <laughs> the church wasn't... The Faith of the Seven was not on board for the Targaryens going through incest at the moment. So you might rule us now, but... Oh. Yep. <laughs> we have words. We have many words. Yep. Uh, and uh, uh, when Aenys died in 42 AC... Uh, instead of his oldest son taking the throne, which was, you know, the original plan, instead of his half-brother, Magor, the first Targaryen, sort of usurped the throne. That's uh, this man here. Uh, ah. Magor the Cruel. <laughs> uh, oh, boy. Who ruled from 42 AC to 48 AC. And, uh, yeah, he essentially ended up in a war with the church. Ah, always great when that happens. Yep. And, uh, he eventually... Uh, it, it was him who built the Red Keep, uh, which is the main, well, keep in the King's Landing. Uh, and, uh... I think he had like three wives that he All kept. Sisters. Yeah, that he kept locked in the tower. Oh, well. Yep. Well then. Thankfully, however, he was defeated, and uh, his nephew uh, Aenys's oldest son, Yaharis, took the throne. And okay. uh, Jaehaerys was the one who ruled the longest, from uh, 48 AC to 103 AC. Uh, Jaehaerys is also known as the Wise and the Old King, because both, well, he was seen as the first, like, proper good king. <laughs> the one actual sane person here. Yeah, th there are actually sane people in this family are few and far between, but when, when they show up, they're good. They're really good. <laughs> Shockingly enough. Yep. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of his heirs ended up dying. So, mm, uh, that's a sh so help, I'm gonna guess a, a brother of his took the throne after that. Uh, no. Uh, so what happened was, uh, <clears throat> towards the end of his reign, he, there was a great council held, uh, mm -hmm. where a bunch of all the great lords showed up to vote between his uh, cl two closest relatives, 
both of the, both grandchildren of his. But like, which okay. one should be the heir? Ah, uh. and uh, the choice was uh, between like the daughter of his oldest son or the son of his second son. Hmm. It's the case of, oh, had his oldest son had a son as well? Wouldn't be a question. But since it's, you know, was a daughter rather than a son, uh, oh. It, it, it's very much that sort of like old school, like actual historical sort of sexism that actually existed where ruling is a man's job. Of course. Yep. Of course they'd be doing that here. Uh, and uh, after the one they chose was Viserys the first. Mm. And this also set a precedent that yeah, even though like a daughter might have a higher claim yeah, it, it's still the son that comes first which is going to be very important what hap- with what happens after this series okay yeah I was going to say yep uh, so this series Targaryen the, the young king ruled from 103 AC to 129 AC okay and for those of you who uh, have watched House of the Dragon you would recognize him being played by uh, Patty Considine in that show marvelous, marvelously. That man deserves a fucking Emmy for that performance. I've been hearing good things about. Oh, it's mm, it's so good. Hmm. There, there, like, there's very few issues, but it, it's overall really good. I see. But uh, the series Targaryen. The series, the first. With his first wife, Emma Aaron, he did not really have sons. As, uh, well, he had sons, but uh, none of them survived. Okay. So he ended up naming his only daughter, Rhaenyra, as heir. Mm-hmm. I sensed a big butt in this, though. Yep. Because, uh, I mean, after his wife, Emma Aaron, died, he remarried to Alicent Hightower. Hmm. Okay. And was able to have four more children, including three sons. Ah. So, when the series passed away, the question of inheritance came up again. Though, this time, instead of just being settled with the Great Council, we go full-on civil war. Well, uh, here we go. Yep, at, War for the throne. <laughs> as uh, we get the Dance of the Dragons. Which I will get to after going through the dynasty. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, after the series, uh, officially crowned was his oldest son, Aegon II, the usurper, the elder. And you will understand why I refer to him as the elder, because uh, here in a bit, but uh, Aegon II ruled from. 129 to 131 AC. Well, Only... That's not too long. <laughs> yep. As he dies during the Dance of the Dragons. Hmm. And uh, the Dance of Dragons ends when his nephew, Rhaenyra's son, not her oldest son, her, uh, yeah, her th- fourth son. Oh, jeez. <laughs> her only son that's still alive. Mm-hmm. Uh, Aegon the Third 
becomes king. Uh, Aegon the Younger, as, as it would be. And uh, he's also referred to as the Dragon Bane, as it was during his rule the last few dragons died out. And, uh, yeah, from this point on, in, like, 131 AC to the start of the main show in 298 AC, no dragons existed. Just at all. Yep. Nothing. No dragons. Huh. Uh, but, yeah, Aegon III ruled for... Yeah, 131 to 157 AC, before passing away and being succeeded by his oldest son, Darren I, the Young Dragon. He Now, why did he have that title? Uh, he was a young man, and he was a fiery man. A great warrior. Who may have been a bit too uh, fiery. Just a touch. Yep, as uh, Darren only ruled for four years, between 157 AC to 161. Hmm. Hmm. And after Darren died, as he had no no heirs, the throne passed to his brother. And here I'm getting this whole theme of like a lot of no air situations here. Oh yeah, don't worry, it's gonna continue. <laughs> uh, as uh, but here we have Baylord, the first Targaryen. Mm. Baylor Tar was the first Targaryen. Interesting. Yep. Uh, Baylor Targaryen. The Blessed. As, uh, Baylor was super fucking religious. Oh, was, like, the religion of, like, the Seven? Yep. He was, like, hardcore. For mm. that. He became a priest? He took a vow of celibacy? then became king somehow <laughs> <laughs> yes as Senri said only proper laying some of these kings were doing was getting laid in coffins <laughs> ooh man <laughs> uh, don't worry I'm getting to someone who got laid a lot more <laughs> soon <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> uh, yeah uh, Baylor unfortunately passed away after like fasting for 40 days Oh, he was trying to pull a Jesus. Oh, yes. Oh, dear. <laughs> and uh, again, as he had no heirs, the God throne <laughs> passed to his uncle, who was Hand of the King at the time, uh, Viserys II. Hmm. Now. All right. We're really jumping all over the place into this whole family tree here. Oh, yes. Uh, the series the second was not a popular king. Many people assumed that he poisoned Baylor. Though, I there, see. Though in general, he was kind of a good king. He was not. Or he was neither good nor bad, as he is the one who only ruled for one year in one seventy one to one seventy two. <laughs> As, uh, when he died, this guy took over. This here is Aegon IV, Viserys' oh. son. Oh, I already don't like the look of him. I'm concerned. <laughs> oh, uh, don't worry. His nickname was the Unworthy. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> now, oh, Aegon IV... Fucked the balance of the world, or the balance of Westeros, so badly. God, what did he do? Let's just say, some of the act- I'm, I'm gonna get into what he, is, he did later, because 
it is part of of it's a very important thing and I have a specific part for it but uh, let's just say he slept around a lot oh and one oh. <laughs> when he died he legitimized all of his bastards Okay, now that's just hilarious now. Okay, I... That just feels like one final F you to the world. It's like, oh, you saw those. <laughs> Let me just throw everything into disarray for the war. You all thought me as bad. Fuck you all. It was kind of that, but it was a bit more directed. It was a big old middle finger to the next son. Or to the next king. His eldest son, his only true-born child, oh or his only <laughs> no, or let me correct that. It wasn't his only true-born son, or it was his oldest son, and I think yeah, only true-born son. But uh, cause <laughs> again, this this is where it gets really complicated because Aegon the Fourth had. Fifteen confirmed children. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> Thirteen of which were bastards. And then he legitimized all as one final gift for his son. As I hate. Yep. It's your problem now. Uh, Have it, fun. It, yeah. Again, it, it's meant as a big fuck you towards his trueborn son. Darren. Hmm. Uh, who became... But Darren was still his oldest, so he still became king after him. Though he's the one who had to deal with uh, multiple attempted rebellions over the years because of that. Uh, also, I... Oh, sorry, gone. No, no, all good, all good. Yep. All right, it sounded like you were saying something, but I forgot to mention that Aegon the Fourth ruled from twelve e ruled for twelve years between one seventy two to one eighty four. Wait, so he basically had he had more than one kid per year. Oh yep. my God. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, and I mean he oh, was super. He was. What a bastard, man. <laughs> oh. He was super bastard. Like, there's a part of the story where his favorite mistress does something to piss him off. So essentially, he sends her back to her home and then takes a new mistress from a family that her family fucking hates. Just to spite her. <laughs> Uh, Jeez, that's yeah. such a petty man, oh my god. <laughs> There's a reason why he's called the Unworthy. Jeez. Uh, but, as I said, after him, Darren II became king. Uh, Darren the Good, as he was called. Which, uh, I, I feel like it might not say too much comparing him to the previous kings. By him being called the good. It's not a very high bar to be better than the past kings in this case. Yeah. Uh, but he ruled in between 184 to 209 AC. And uh, it was actually Darren who uh, brought Dorne into the Seven Kingdoms. Huh. Okay. Uh, by marrying a Dornish princess. And uh, he did give Dorn some special rights. Okay. But he did manage to bring them into the fold. Uh, so after... Uh, Here we also have another case of bad luck with heirs. Yet again. As his Once oldest more. 
Yeah, his oldest son, Baylor, died in a trial by combat. Oh. Uh, yikes. Yeah, um... It was a special kind of trial by combat called Trial of Seven, where each side had seven knights. Hmm. And uh, the the one who swung the mace that killed Baylor was his younger brother Makar. Ooh! Oh! Yep. Unlucky indeed. Jeez. Yep. It. He did not intend to kill him, but that's unfortunately how it ended. Uh, if anyone wants to know more of that story, I can uh, suggest to you all pick up uh, The Hedge Knight, the first story of Duncan Egg. Unlucky indeed, my yes. god. Yes. <laughs> uh, and then there's also the fact that... Uh, Uh, a few years after that, a plague struck in uh, 209, killing both Daeron and his son uh, Baylor's two only sons, Valar and Mataris. Hmm. So he managed to deal with all the illegitimate bastards that are all legitimized at the last minute, somehow. Uh, I mean... He dealt. Somehow. Darren managed to deal with his half siblings that were a pest, partially. They always came, tried to come back. <laughs> but I'll um I'll be getting to the Blackfire Rebellions here in a bit. Oh boy! <laughs> but uh, also during this plague, uh, Darren's other son Regal died. Okay. Man does not have luck, my yep. goodness. So, uh, his second son, Ares, ended up becoming king. Ares the first. <laughs> who ruled from 209 to 221 AC. Before, unfortunately, dying without any heirs. Yet again. Yep. Once more time. So, at this point, Darren's Fourth son, Makar, becomes king. Alright. Makar the Anvil. Huh. That's, a, that's quite a title to get. Yep. What the heck did he do? Well, uh, it's essentially in one of the uh, battles of the Blackfire Rebellions. It is said that uh, Baylor and Makar together struck against uh, they crushed the Blackfire forces between themselves like a hammer and an anvil hmm. so he became the anvil I mean I suppose that's appropriate yep uh, though his older brother Baylor I think had a much cooler nickname Breakspear okay that's even cooler what the heck <laughs> Yep, because GRM. Huh. Baylor Breakspear, because he was a master, like, he was a master at, like, jousting. And then he'd just be able to, man, that's such a cool title. Oh. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, but then eventually in 233 AC... Yes, a master of the meaty poker. The meaty poker, man. It... <laughs> oh, just, just, just a man who can break some meaty pokers. Yep. Uh, but then, unfortunately, Makar died in two thirty three AC. Unfortunate indeed. And this is actually a time where there wasn't a lack of. I mean, this is a time where there wasn't a lack of uh, heirs. In fact, there was too many heirs. Oh god, we've got to the reverse problem here. Yep. 
Oh no. <laughs> So, uh, another great council had to be held to, uh, decide who would be, become king. Mm-hmm. So, the first one was, uh, Makar's oldest son, Arion. Arion Brightflame. Uh, I just had to bring that nickname up as well. It's, just, he just never misses with these titles. Yep. Uh, yeah, no one wanted Arion to be king, because he was kind of insane. Ah, well, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, uh, on that note, Arion later died drinking wildfire, because he thought it would turn him in- into a dragon. One way to go. Yep, and for oh, those of you... <laughs> Who don't know what wildfire is in Game of Thrones? Magical napalm. Magical Greek fire, yep. Yep. And he drank a bunch of it thinking he would become a dragon. Uh, but. What a way to go. Yep. So then they came to uh, Arion's second. Or Makar's. Well, they had Makar's son as well, Magor. And I was like, hmm, no, his father was crazy. We, we don't want to risk it. But then it was Makar's second son, Darren. No, he's a drunk. We don't want him either. So then we came... could not pick. Yep, so then we came... T- then it came to... Uh, Makar's third son, Aemon. Who said, no, fuck you. I don't want to be king. I want to be a maester. <laughs> I mean, considering what all the kings have gone through, I don't blame him. Yep. Also, by the way, a- again, anyone watching who's who's familiar with this series, or has, has like only watched a show or something, that Aemon is Maester Aemon at Castle Black. Oh, like the, the the very, very old guy over yep. there once Sam got over to the maesters. Yep. Oh. Yeah, that's... That's that Aemon. Huh. So yep. he's just he's just outlived everybody since he's just been kind of there doing his thing. Yep. Kind of watching over all the... I, I imagine ensuing chaos after he declined to take this run. He'd just be like, oh, thank you. Thank the gods I didn't do that. Yep. Uh, and then it came to the fourth option. Aegon. <laughs> hmm. He is Targaryen. He does have knightly experience after being a squire to a knight for several years. Oh, shit. Wait, no, that was a hedge knight. Oh, shit. <laughs> he's, he's having all these ideas about peasants having rights. Oh no! We oh can't no! Have that in our kingdom. <laughs> yep. Uh, and then it was like, okay, uh, do we have a fifth option? <laughs> Jeez. There, there was a fifth option, but that fifth option never got a chance because he was murdered. Oh. Yeah. Uh, because uh, that fifth option was uh. From the was a black fire, and let's just say there was a certain someone who decided, okay, no, I've dealt too much trying to fight the black fires. We're not having a black fire king. Murder. <laughs> yeah, generally speaking, that does not seem like a good idea. Yep. You know. <laughs> uh, so Aegon became king. Aegon the fifth. The unlikely. No, oh, after all that yeah. deliberation. Yeah. yeah, I can understand why you'd get that title. Yeah, there's also the fact that he was the fourth son of a fourth son. <laughs> Normally, <laughs> generally speaking, that's like, oh yeah, you're the fourth son of the fourth son? Eh, have fun, I guess. Do whatever you want, no one cares. <laughs> 
It's like, you'd have no real, like, stuff you need to be doing there. Yeah. Uh, he rolled from 233 to 259 AC. Before dying when Summerhall, the Targaryen family summer house, burned down. Oh. Uh, where he died, his oldest son died, and uh, his best friend and Lord Commander of the Knights, uh, the Knight. The King's Guard. That's it. The Lord Commander mm. of the King's Guard, Sir Duncan the Tall, also died. Well then, huh? Totally unsuspicious fire. Hmm. Uh, hmm. hmm. I will actually go into that a little bit later, actually. Oh, neat. <laughs> because we actually do know what happened there. Ah, finally, something that's not just left in mystery. Hold. Yes. Uh, and then after Aegon, his second son, Jaehaerys, ruled. Uh, mm. Jaehaerys II, from 259 to 262. Not mu uh, Some things happened during his rule, but nothing really important. He's not really important. He's just kind of there. Yep. It's Jaehaerys' son that is the very important to the events of this story, as uh, Jaehaerys' only son was uh, the last Targaryen king, Aerys II, the Mad King. Oh, with the I just noticed his fingernails. Yeah, uh he got super oh. paranoid towards the end of his rule where he wouldn't he wouldn't let anyone groom him, so his beard grew really long, his fingernails grew really, really long. He wouldn't bathe. He wouldn't bathe. Oh jeez. Okay. <laughs> God. Oh. <laughs> yeah, because he thought, uh, he he, he thought everyone w was out to get him. He 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 was the Mad King for a reason. <laughs> Understandably, yeah, not, yeah. not bathing. What did he think? Somebody would poison his bath water or something? Yeah, or you know, maybe come in while he's uh, bathing and just drown him. Oh Jesus! <laughs> yeah, he he was insane, and uh, yeah, he ruled. Towards his rule ended in 283 when uh, uh, Robert Baratheon rose up against him and his family, killed his oldest son, and uh, yeah, then Ares was stabbed in the back by one of his own Kingsguard. Ah, yes, a certain someone. <laughs> yes, a certain Kingslayer. A certain Kingslayer and uh, Sister Fricker. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh and that's I mean he's outlived by two of his children, Daenerys and Viserys. <laughs> and uh yeah. possibly at least one of his grandchildren. That's a big maybe. Yes. Uh um Possibly one of his t grandchildren. Possibly two of his grandchildren. Potentially. We don't know for sure, but yes. we have theories. Yes, because... I mean, uh, it's one of the theories about Jon Snow. And then there's one of the other characters that claimed to be Aegon VI, Rhaegar's oldest son. Oh, hold on a moment. That Hold on. <laughs> Huh. But wait a second. That does that doesn't seem right. Hold on. Hmm. Uh, okay, it, continue on. Yep. It, it's one of those things of there, there's a lot of evidence to points that he might be something else, but I might get into that when I'm talking about the black fires. Oh yeah. We we kept on mentioning them and then it's like all right, what's what was actually going on with this whole rebellion? Yeah, uh, first of all, just a little quick thing about uh, the Dance of Dragons. Hmm, what what the dragons doing in all of this? Oh, yeah, oh. the Civil War 
between the green faction, led by Aegon II, and also his mother, Alicent Hightower, mm-hmm. and uh, the black faction, led by Rhaenyra Targaryen. Lasted for about three years. Uh, a lot of people died on both sides. Okay. A lot of... Usual Civil War type stuff. Yep. Uh, though there's a lot of interesting characters that, I, that are in this part of the story, like uh, Corlys Valarian, the Sea Serpent, uh, Daemon the Rogue Prince, Aemon the One-Eye. He just keeps hitting with these titles. Yep. Oh my god. <laughs> Aemon... Aemon Targaryen has one of my favorite like character design details in this series. <laughs> he lost one of his eyes as a child. Hmm. And uh, he has a sapphire in the uh, in the place of the, an eye there now. Oh my god. <laughs> that's that's kind of cool. Yep. Uh, which led me to, like, I kind of want at some point to make a character that has, like, the magic item Ursat's eye. But oh, fl- yeah, just the magical replacement eye. Yep, and flavor it as, like, a, a sapphire or something. Oh, that would be cool. Yep. And, ooh! <laughs> ah, Cal Cal! Ah, Cali! Why, hello there! Yes, hi! <sighs> Uh, it is not only Perth, it is also Aussie. Indeed. Perth and Aussie. At your surface. Uh, I'm doing good. It's been a... Yeah, same here. Uh, hammering all the lore into his head. I'm absorbing as much as I can. I've absorbed many unexpected things. Yes. Uh... Also, the Targaryens are a big bloody mess. Holy crap. Yep. Yes, that that is a very good way of describing them. Uh, and oh, sorry, go on. Inbreeding for days. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Again, there's so much inbreeding, inbreeding that hentai gets jealous. <laughs> God. <laughs> I still can't get over your whole bit. He couldn't choose between the two sisters, so he went with both. Yes. Uh, also cat people. Yes. Again, just just cat people. Uh, and uh, I mean, I also mentioned the, the problem with this before the stream, this part of the story, mm-hmm. where yeah, because uh, this whole civil war just seems like its own big tale. Yep. Uh, again, it's the whole thing of ah yes, written like a history book. Here we have three historical. Su- Sources, one who wasn't there at all until after, one who was there for parts of it, and then one who was there for the entirety of it, but is, but is super unreliable. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're, yeah. <laughs> I think that's a good way to put it. They're, they're. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, but yeah. Uh, uh, the Dance of Dragons ended with both Aegon the Second and Rhaenyra dead, and Rhaenyra's son Aegon married Yahira. That was Aegon. Aegon the Third married Aegon the Second's daughter Yahira, and sort of joined the two factions together and brought peace. Also probably helped that, like, the the Stark Lord at the time just came down and was like, okay, cool, I'm gonna j- help you get the throne. <laughs> Again, uh, the, as you were saying, the only, like, reasonable thinking people in this whole setting. Yes. Uh, and, <laughs> yes. Uh, funnily enough, <laughs> we get into, uh, well, the start about the Black Fires. Mm. And we start with Aegon the Fourth and his bastards. 
Ah, uh, yes, his 13 bastards. Yep. So, we're only going to focus on four here, because most of them aren't important. <laughs> but uh, these four are four of the six great bastards. God. Let's start with this young man right here. This is Damon Waters. He is uh, Aegon's son that he had with his cousin, Dana. Oh, great. The more incest. Ah, of course. Yes. And, uh, I mean, to be fair, Aegon's wife was his sister. I, okay, true. You got me there. Yep. Uh, Damon was a great warrior. He was charming and charismatic. He was charismatic, and a lot of he was very much well liked by a lot of the nobility, especially compared to his brother Darren, who was more studious. Hmm. Also, oh, uh, a stretch from bills and a hydrate. Oh, okay, dog. Oh, a posture check. Thank you, bills. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And to also fully explain the situation with Damon. I need to explain something else. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, but that is the concept of ancestral swords, or heirloom swords. Ancestral. Yes, it was... Jeez. There was one point when I told Senator about this and she thought I said incestral. I mean, I don't blame her considering all of this... Yeah, what the Targaryens be and all such, but <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, uh, but a lot of uh, the big noble houses have these swords that pass. They're passed down from like father to son. Like uh, how Stark has the great sword ice. That it's hmm. it, it's most of the time it's also seen as an extra symbol. And most of these are also Valerian steel swords. Ah, go figure. Yep. House Targaryen had two of these, which were mm -hmm. Black Fire and Dark Sister. Okay. Black Fire was always given, was either always held by the king or the heir. Hmm. So it. It was called the King's Sword. While Dark Sister was often given to the greatest warrior. Oh. But Aegon decided to bestow Blackfire. Oh, fair enough. Uh, thank you for lurking, Bells, and I, I do appreciate the drop in. Uh,. Yeah, understandable. I hope you can get some rest. And, uh, yeah. Thank you. Will do. Right. Thank you very much. Yeah. And as Percy said, get yourself some good rest. Yeah. Uh, but Aegon essentially went to against what was normally expected as he gifted Blackfire to Damon as he knighted him. Hmm. And uh, this is going to be a very important detail for later. <laughs> noted, noted. Uh, the next of the great bastards we're going to note here, because it's very important, is uh, this man. Agor, this guy. Agor Rivers. Also known as Bittersteel. He's... I probably get to repeat this so many times, but all these titles. It's yeah. just like... Oh, 
I know, right? Good. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I know. The names are on point. So, Agor Rivers. Uh, his mother was Barbara Bracken from House Bracken in the Riverlands. And at the time, her father was actually Hand of the King. And they were scheming to have Barbara became, become queen. Oh, okay. Also in the hopes of possibly being able to make her son king in the future. I mean, usual scheming to take the throne type stuff. Yep. Unfortunately, their scheme was uncovered. Uh, Barbara's father was killed, executed, and she was sent back to their home in the Riverlands. Hmm. Uh... There was a lot of things, and uh, this as well that led to Agor being a very angry boy. Like uh, the fact that he loved a woman, yet she shows the man he hated the most over him. So he was... He well, very much earned the name Bitter Steel. Again, such a good title. Uh. <laughs> but, as I kind of mentioned earlier, when Barbara Bracken was removed from court, Aegon decided to be extra petty, and his next mistress was someone from a family the Brackens hated. This man made it as one single goal to just be a dick to everybody. Yes. Uh, just wait until you hear what he did to what he tried to do to both his wife and his son, also kind of his brother. Oh my god! <laughs> but uh, yeah, he it was Melissa Blackwood, <laughs> and uh, Melissa and Aegon had three children together. Two daughters and a son. The daughters aren't important, unfortunately, but the son is very important. As, uh, it's this man here. Okay. Now, this is here is one of my personal favorite characters here. Brynden oh. Rivers, a.k.a. Blood Raven. Ah, uh, damn it, GRM. <laughs> Uh, How did he get this title? It's because he has a birthmark on the side of his face that's crimson red in the shape of a raven. Ah, go figure. Yep. Uh, Blood Raven is an interesting character. As uh, I mean, first of all, just note his appearance. He was born albino. Okay. Which is why he is, like, even paler with, like, pure white hair and red eyes. Hmm. But, uh, of course, he had a rivalry with Agor as they came from families that hated each other. But, he was... Uh, he became a great warrior, as he was also given the other Valyrian steel sword, Dark Sister. So the two Valyrian swords of the Targaryens just ended up in bastard hands. Yep. Though one was more earned than the other, as the other was just pure fucking spite. Jeez. <laughs> yep. Uh, Brynden was a master archer as well, wielding a bow carved from weirwood. Hmm. And he actually had a 
special company of archers called the Raven's Teeth. Again, that's such a good name. Yep. Uh, over his life, he held many positions from Master of Whispers, essentially Spy Master. He served as Hand of the King, and he also eventually served as Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. Oh. Okay, that's not what I expected. Yeah. Uh, it was during his time as both Lord Commander and as Master Whispers. He essentially r ran a uh, brutal police state. Oh, fun. <laughs> yeah. He was brutal in crushing down anyone who even thought about the uh, rebellion. Anyone speak out against the Targaryens? Yeah, you probably see their head on a pike the next day. I kind of like that, but oh goodness. <laughs> yep. Uh, there even started rumors that he was a sorcerer. Hmm. Because he was such a great spy master. I see. And people didn't like him, so they spun <laughs> tales of him turning into like a swarm of birds to spy on his foes. Jeez. <laughs> I mean, that's one cool heck of a rumor by the same time. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yep. uh, he did lose one of his eyes in uh, combat during uh, the first Blackfire Rebellion. Uh, it was actually bitter steel that cut out his eye. Hmm. And uh, after that, there was a riddle that started going around. Or more like, well, not really a riddle, but more like something people would say in regards to him. How many eyes does the Lord Blood Raven have? A thousand eyes and one. Well then. Yep. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, he... It's the one that me I mentioned the earlier as well where... Ah, yes, great counsel. Uh, yeah, no, I'm not dealing with any more black fires. Murder. <laughs> we can't... We can't have this man take the throne. Yep. And, uh, because of that he was sent up to the wall where he eventually became... Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. Hmm. Until he eventually disappeared beyond the wall. Just gone one day. Yep. I mean, he kind of appeared uh, like a hundred years later. Oh, kind of? Yeah, because there was a bit more to those rumors of him being a sorcerer than just rumors. God, he actually was a sorcerer. <laughs> yeah, he's a green seer. Oh. Oh. Yeah, not only is he a green seer, uh. Well, uh. Since you watched at least up to season four of the show, you might remember Bran having dreams of a three eyed raven. That's him? That yes. was him? Yes. He is oh. the, the three-eyed raven. So he's just been kind of... been hiding out to the north there. Yep. Just biding his time, watching. Yep. And uh, in season six of Game of Thrones, he was played by legendary Swedish actor Max von Sydow. May he rest in peace. May he rest in peace indeed. Yep. And as I said at the start of this... Uh, he also, Max von Sydow also voiced Esburn in uh, Skyrim. <laughs> Funnily enough. Funnily enough. Yep. Fun. Uh, and 
there, there's one more of Aegon's great bastard here. And it's this woman. Oh. Shiera Seastar. I think she's also the last of his children. Okay. Uh, so what's notable about her? Well, uh, first of all, she was a daughter from of a woman from across the sea, from Essos. Hmm. Uh, it's okay. it's said Shira was the most beautiful woman in the world. And most interestingly, most interestingly enough, she actually had a heterochromia. Oh. With one blue and one green eye. Hmm. Uh, okay. It is said that she was a sorceress who bathed in the blood of virgins to remain young. Ah, ah, the good old battery treatment. Yep. Considering she hung out a lot with Bloodraven, there might be something to her being a sorcerer. But we don't. Perhaps. Yep. Because here's another very important part. Uh, and this is a quote from the book. <laughs> Bitter Steel and Bloodraven both loved Shiera and the world burned. Great more incest. Who would have thought? <laughs> yeah, because uh, yeah, both Bloodraven and Bitter Steel fell in love with their half sister. But ah. hey, she fell in love with <laughs> Uh, it, with Bloodraven, so, uh... Uh, well, incest ahoy, just incest everywhere. Yep. Uh, but, then we get to, uh, the Blackfire Rebellions. I'm just gonna ask to ask for a quick uh, washroom break. Just gotta oh. go real. Oh quick yeah, here. sorry, <laughs> sorry. No <dude>. worries. <laughs> We've been going for quite a while. No, no, it's okay. I'm, I'm like, I'm quite interested in the Blackfire because I. This is actually something I've like never heard of at all whatsoever. So yeah. I'm, I am quite curious about how this plays out. Mm -hmm. But I'll be right back because nature calls. Of course. Uh so another uh, bit of a break. Uh, I did not expect this to... Uh... Uh, I, I really went all in here. Uh... <clears throat> I hope you're all enjoying this. Uh, of course, uh, if anyone has any questions, I'll happily answer them. I do hope everyone's doing well uh, tonight. Uh, this lovely Saturday evening. Uh, again, I did not expect this to... Uh, to be this long. <laughs> uh, I do feel also... I, I do... I have gone off on a few, uh, like, side tangents and the like, so. Uh. <clears throat> and, uh. So, yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know, uh. Uh, again, I'm I, I, back. Oh, welcome back. Yeah. So, the Black Fire Rebellions. <clears throat> yes. So, as I mentioned, Damon Waters was given the sword Black Fire. 
and he eventually decided to take its name for himself, becoming Damon Blackfire. Now, there's a lot of things that really go into this. Uh, first of all, we have to start with something that Aemon, or Aegon the Fourth did. That was uh, mm. another action of him being very petty and spiteful. Oh, <laughs> who would have sunk? Uh, essentially, he claimed that his wife had uh, been uh, unfaithful. Hmm. And that because of that, uh, Darren wasn't his son. He actually went on to claim that not only was Darren not his son, but he was instead the son of his own brother, Sir Aemon the Dragon Knight, who was Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. What did this man have against his son? Jesus. <laughs> yeah, he, again, he was a spiteful bastard of a man. Clearly, jeez. Yep. Uh, eventually, when Queen Nerys' honor was brought into proper question, 